Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. We'll be having more people join as we go along, but I do want to respect everyone's time. So it is my honor um, as one of the organizers for the One Health Symposium that we're kicking off now to be able to recognize all of the hard work that has gone into this. My name is Vatrina Smith. I'm the Associate Dean for Global Programs at the University of California, Davis School of Medi Veterinary Medicine and the Students for One Health Club involving students from the veterinary school, the medical school, and really linking out to students that we um, have as part of our networks around the world have done a lot of work to organize this three hour symposium event. So as we get going, I'm going to turn over first to Dean Stetter for any welcoming remarks he might like to share. And then we'll keep on going. If Dr. Nigaga is with us from the Africa One Health University Network, she will also share a couple of welcoming remarks and then we'll kick off with our case competition. The student case competition is going to feature four different films created by student teams from around the world. And we do have ex excellent judges also from different places in the world that will be part of judging them during the symposium event so we can announce the winners towards the end. So it's a very exciting real-time competition. And we will welcome comments about those student case competition videos in the chat box as well from the audience as we go along. The second hour of our symposium will feature the Calvin Schwabe lectureship, the keynote talk from Professor Jacob Zinstog, who's tuning in from Switzerland. And the third hour of our symposium will include a panel really focused on what's working and, and what are some innovations we could consider around wildfire as one of our climate and health disasters that we are facing in many parts of the world. Last but not least, of course, I'm really thinking about um, recognizing the work that went into the student case competition that we will be viewing in a couple of minutes, but also awarding the multimedia winners from the contests that have been going on over the, the previous weeks. So a lot of exciting things coming into play here. Really wanted to extend my welcome and thank you to everyone and turn it over to Dean Stetter from the UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine for any welcome remarks he might like to share next. Thanks, Dr. Smith, and welcome everybody. Hey, I'm super excited uh, that everybody's gathering today. It's uh, early here in California, but I know it's different time zones all over the all over the world. Um, I love the fact that this is a student-led effort across all these different professions in all these different countries. And a special thanks to Dr. Martin and to the folks at CUGH, um, to the leadership at the One Health Institute at Davis, so Drs. Lane, Smith, and Zaccardi. Um, these uh, conferences are, are complicated, but super important. So thanks to everybody. Hey, um, I'm going to do a quick quiz here and feel free to chat, uh, chat in the, to um, put your answers in the chat section. But um, let's go back for a little bit to the year 1900. I know nobody here was alive then, um, but think about a little over 100 years ago, 120 years ago. What do you think the la average life expectancy was uh, from a worldwide perspective? What was the average life expectancy for people? And I'll give you a minute just to ponder that. <clears throat> and while you're at it, um, think about what it is now. Um, how long in uh, current state do pe people live from an average perspective? And I'll give you some hints that in the last hundred years, we've uh, invented antibiotics, we've invented vaccines. Um, think about uh, how crazy it would have been a hundred plus years ago for people to get transplants for hearts or livers or lungs to be transplanted from one person to another. So the, the amount of knowledge just in the last hundred years, the amount of medical breakthroughs have been significant. So 1900, um, Average life expectancy across the world was 31 years. Um, average life expectancy now is uh, over 70, so about 73 years from a worldwide perspective in the year 2020. So we have more than doubled uh, the life expectancy of people in that amount of time. So the next question is going to be around global food production. Um, just going to 1960, actually, uh, year I was born. Um, when we go from 1960 today to today from land space, how much incremental land are we using to grow food? And interestingly enough, um, that's only 10%. Um, we use 
land and wild space for a lot of different things. But if you look at land space for food production, it has only gone up since 1960 by 10%. And yet food production has gone up by about 400%. And we know that major breakthroughs, whether that be genetics or irrigation or fertilizer, have allowed us to work towards feeding the world. And these are huge improvements. Um, and I'm not even thinking about things like the technology and the computers um, that we carry in our hands as phones. So these are huge breakthroughs and yet we know there are, there are huge challenges in front of us and whether that be pandemics and infectious disease like we've just been through on a global scale or we think about global warming and climate change, these are all making our world more dangerous. Um, but I'm hopeful and I'm excited because of conferences and because of people like you that there are lots of things afoot that we can do to change. The One Health approach is collaborative, it's multidisciplinary, it's using um, a global network of people to solve today's problems. And I think they are, this collaboration is One Health approach it is just as valuable and will create just as many discoveries as the last hundred years, whether that be antibiotics, um, or vaccines and things of that sort. So I thank you all for uh, making this a priority and, and being interested in this and helping make us uh, better people and better society. I uh, look forward to participating in the conference and, and um, I hope everybody has a great, great morning. Thanks, Dean Stetter. So wonderful to have you with us, especially at this early hour of the morning. But I know for many of our colleagues, it's the middle of the day or even in the evening. So thanks everyone for taking the time today. I would love to give the microphone to Dr. Irene Nagaga for any welcomes she would like to share. She should be tuning in from Uganda, if I understand correctly, and it's always wonderful to work with her and her team across our countries in Africa in the USAID One Health Workforce Next Generation Project. And we have a couple of our judges for the case competition coming from their sister organization, Siahun, the Southeast Asia One Health University Network. Irene, are you able to um, talk with us this morning or this evening? Sure, thank you so much, Watrina. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be part of this global team, global consortium, working with the uh, University of California, Davis. Greetings from Kampala, Uganda. It's, it's now 4 p.m. So it's we are quite several miles away from each other, but we are happy to be part of this global team. And I wanted to, as a remark, to just emphasize that the world we are in today, we really need to work together. The world has become smaller, so globalization is now our way, our way of life. Briefly about Africa One Health University Network, we are a network of 19 universities on the African continent. Uh, we are in 10 countries at the moment, and we are growing every day. It's a multidisciplinary network that is leading change in developing a One Health workforce. Uh, and this is a workforce not only with uh, the technical skills, but also with a transformative mindset to work across sectors. So we are happy to be, myself and my colleague who is going to be a judge, we're happy to be part of this um, global One Health Symposium and we congratulate you all upon this event. Uh, from Asata Frohon, we wish you all the best. Um, this is a space, this symposium is also, always a space where there's a lot of feasting in terms of knowledge. And there's a lot of learning, there's a lot of knowledge sharing. Uh, we are at a level where the One Health space has many actors. So I'm hoping that a number of people have been invited and are connecting in from uh, different parts of the world and will be able to share either through the chat or through presentations, but also through questions. So, um, and then there's a case competition. Congratulations to those who have made it this far. I, I wish you the best. This is also space where there's a lot of innovation coming from students. In our network, we hold these um, a lot of times at country level, but also at, at continental level. So it's really a space where these students demonstrate creativity and innovations. And I believe you're going to, to learn a lot. Those who are connecting are not part of uh, the competition. So I wish everyone um, a good time. 
this morning, depending on your time zone, and this evening, wherever you are in Africa. So thank you so much again, Watrina, for inviting us to be part of this. And um, we look forward to learning a lot and sharing what we can from our network. Thank you. And I want to return the microphone back to you. Thanks, Dr. Nagaga. It's wonderful to be together. I'm glad we were in person in Kampala not too long ago, and I'm sure those collaborations will continue in either way. So we're going to kick off our student case competition finals, the presentations. And um, we have a wonderful student leader, Maddie, who will be facilitating this. But let me just briefly mention our esteemed judges who are participating in this um, to help us decide on a winner by the end of this symposium. And we will announce it um, a little bit later on. So first you can see we have Professor Deli Ogunsitan. He is coming to us from UC Irvine. And we've been honored to work with him as one of our leaders in the One Health Workforce Next Generation Project supported by USAID. The second judge we have here today is Latifa Hassan, a leader from the, the Malaysia One Health University Network and really a, a leader in everything One Health, especially <laughs> involving students um, across the Southeast Asia region. It's been wonderful to work with her over recent years. And then we have our excellent experts from both Siahoon and Afrahoon who've come to us with a specialization in communication. So we have Phi coming to us from Siahoon, who um, really has done an amazing job building up their social media platform and risk communication aspects within the technical space as well. Thank you, Phi, for being with us. And on the Afrahoon side, Ms. Millie Natimba. And it's really nice to see both of them putting their skills to work and able to interact with our students in a way after all of the amazing things they've done to really bring communication styles into the next gen space in ways some of the rest of us could, could not do quite as effectively. So thanks everyone for being here. They will be reviewing and watching and maybe asking a question um, as time allows after the videos that will be coming right now. So Maddie, over to you. Let's go ahead and kick off our first video when you're ready. All right, hi everyone. Uh, like Dr. Dr. Mrs. said, we'll be entering the case competition portion of the session where we get to hear from teams across the globe on their One Health approach to climate change induced natural disasters in their area. So as Dr. Smith mentioned, as our team's presentation videos are playing, audience members are encouraged to put their questions in their chat that the team members can answer in the chat while their presentation videos are playing. And then at the end of each presentation, we'll have uh, just a few minutes in between the videos where, all, uh, where one judge can ask a question for our team to answer live. And then after each video, we'll rotate to a different judge to, to ask a question. And Michaela put in the chat as well that we'll have a timer up for basically the five minute mark just to be conscious of our time as well. So starting us off, is team one, and this is including Tamara, Harold, and Ernesto, and they'll be coming from the University of Costa Rica and UC Davis, and they'll be presenting on drought in Costa Rica. Oh, no. Hi, today we're going to talk about stream droughts in Guanacaste, Costa Rica, solutions through nutrition and sustainable plant production to a one health problem. In Costa Rica, more intense drought conditions, shown in red colors in this image, are centered in the province of Guanacaste, part of the Central American tropical dry forest region called the Dry Corridor, and it's particularly sensitive to droughts. Severe droughts in Guanacaste during the dry season represent one of the greatest challenges that requires a one health approach. The magnitude of droughts can reach a state of emergency, given the economic losses, animal mortality, human health affection, as well as the impact on nutrition in the most vulnerable populations. In 2014, there was already a national emergency in Costa Rica due to severe droughts. This year, the National Emergency Commission warned about the rainfall deficit that is forecast for the second half of 2023 and the first half of 2024 due to a new phenomenon, inadequate development of the animal, reproductive failure, the natal death, and even increases in antimicrobial resistance due to feeding with chicken manure. All these factors, strength, good health, good security, 
economy of the region and the health population. With the deficit of rains come a decrease in the production of forage required for annual feeding, especially in cattle, which represent one of the main socioeconomic activities in the region. This fat deficit translates into metabolic health problems, immunosuppression, secondary infections, mortality due to malnutrition. De la sequía nos afecta mucho. Se muere el ganado, que no haya que comer, no hay agua en las quebradas, en los ríos. Y no hay que darle de comer, porque todo está muy escaso y muy caro. Últimamente la gente opta por vender lo que pueden y lo que no, pues se muere de flaco. The government has indicated to agricultural producers that they don't have the necessary resources to solve the problem related to drought and has urged them to implement all possible resources from the same productive units to defend less on external factors. La problemática del cambio climático, eh, los sistemas de explotación ganadera han tenido que venir cambiando porque las, sequ las sequías han sido muy fuertes y han sido este, devastadoras en esto. Entonces, el sistema de alimentación de los animales ha habido que este, irlo cambiando. Y tratar... In order to face this complex challenge, it is intent to have one health innovative solution in the region to implement humidity sensors in accordance with the cultivation of soybeans, Lysine Max. Se pretende establecer en plantaciones cierta cantidad de sensores de humedad dependiendo de la extensión del cultivo activo, en este caso, soja. Se instalarán los sensores uniformemente en el terreno. Como sabemos que no todos los agricultores tienen acceso a este tipo de tecnología ni el capital necesario para lograr instalar un sensor por planta, por lo tanto, la solución que se propone es crear un registro de datos con los sensores disponibles y de esta manera promediar la necesidad hídrica mediante la toma de datos de los sensores establecidos de acuerdo a la zona específica de siembra. Esto permite conocer las necesidades a través del tiempo y además permite hacer comparaciones y conocer cuáles han sido los cambios en las necesidades hídricas de los cultivos a través de años de producción de datos. Como complemento, se toman mediciones de clorofila en planta con el uso de equipo destinado para sequín. Este muestreo se realiza sin causar un daño a la estructura física de la planta y mejora la comprensión del nivel nutricional. Con esta información se puede cuantificar y relacionar la capacidad fotosintética con la condición adversa por falta de agua. Estos datos serán subidos a una nube para poder medir los cambios y lograr que cada gota de agua que la planta absorba sea eficiente. Esta propuesta tiene como objetivo brindar un producto alimenticio de calidad disponible en el verano, que mitigue el problema de acceso a forrajes para la producción animal a través de una solución innovadora, accesible y sustentable para la región. Asimismo, esto nos permitirá educar a los productores agrícolas sobre el uso racional del agua. A través de una alternativa innovadora a la nutrición animal tradicional, el objetivo es reducir los gases operativos, mejorar los parámetros reproductivos en el ganado, disminuir la morbilidad y mortalidad animal e incluso frenar la expansión de la resistencia a las antimicrobianas. Esperamos que esta iniciativa tenga éxito en el largo plazo y se utilice para otros cultivos como maíz. Asimismo, estos cultivos pueden utilizarse con dos finalidades, subproductos destinados a abordar la desnutrición de la población local y alimentación animal. Esto se traducirá en un beneficio sanitario, económico y social, para los agricultores y sus comunidades, sobre todo por el medio ambiente, ya que se espera reducir considerablemente el consumo de agua, además de generar un ahorro considerable de dinero a las familias con producción agrícola de subsistencia, generando una producción eficiente y consciente que se traduce en mejor calidad de vida a través de One Health. Dado que los recursos gubernamentales son limitados, al presentar esta idea a las autoridades universitarias y el Ministerio de Agricultura y Ganadería, estos se muestran dispuestos a apoyar su desarrollo. Tipos de comida. Se ha probado con un montón de, de tipos de comida, gallinaza, desechos y toda esa cosa. Pero al fin, aquí hemos llegado a la conclusión de que la finca tiene que producir su propio, su propio alimentación para poder subsistir. Entonces se ha optado por la producción de pastos de corta, eh, botón de oro, para complementar proteína y energía.
y este, así poder este, eh, obtener una dieta más, más, más balanceada. Y con eso hemos logrado este, ir este, subiendo este, eh, el nivel de alimentación de los animales y solventando un poco eh, la problemática de la sequía. Sí hay que empezar a usar este, sistemas de riego para optimizar el, el uso del agua y todo ese tipo de cosas. Y, Toda esta cuestión trae este, como consecuencia que una mejor calidad de vida a, al productor y todo ese tipo de cosas porque le ayuda a no, a no ir, este, a no, ir este, este, a no estresarse tanto, a, a no preocuparse tanto por los animales. Los animales están en una mejor condición y entonces así obtienen una mejor calidad de vida. Extreme droughts in Guanacaste represents an emergency, but also a one health problem for the region. We have been able to predict events such as extreme droughts. We have witnessed the havoc it has caused in the past. Our next step is to mitigate the effects with innovative and sustainable solutions, especially that benefit small producers and underserved communities. Through the multidisciplinary collaboration, the implementation of the use of humidity and chlorophyll meters to produce a high quality forage in the dry season to feed livestock, we aim to fight roads related problems like water waste, high quality forage production, economic losses, animal morbidity and mortality, reduced reproductive failures in livestock, low antimicrobial resistance expansion, and improved mental health in the population. In Costa Rica, climate change will continue to cause problems not only in the dry season, but also in the rainy season. We must look for innovative solutions to these problems that integrate the One Health approach. Great presentation, Team One. Uh, I'd like to now turn it over to our judges if uh, I guess they can decide who wants to ask a question for our team. Uh, I can go first to save time. Uh, my name is Dilip Mushetan. Thank you very much, Team One, for your presentation. Uh, I appreciate the uh, creativity of trying to get farmers to grow soy and to use humidity sensors and uh, chlorophyll sensors to optimize the, the yield. But soybean is also sensitive to drought. So I'm wondering how you will maintain sustainability of the program uh, if water resources to keep the plants growing become limited and the soil may also become too dry for, uh, for, for sustainable growth of the plants. Thank you. Hi, everyone. everybody. I am Tamara Porras. Um, I am a member of group one and Nice to meet you, everybody. And okay, and the answer for this question of the uh, judge is uh, here in Santa Cruz, Guanacaste, where is our university. We have soya bean uh, crop, and now is without uh, water resources, and uh, the the crop is growing up very well and also the meaning of these solutions is to make the every every um what the water what we use uh, i'm so sorry um the meaning it's of this okay. the meaning of these uh solutions is to uh, make every drop of water uh, 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 that the plant needs, and then this is not uh, like um, 
we make like uh, more water needs than the plant needs. And then we, when we create a, a mean of the needs water, that's with that we'll we will make uh every drop of water um efficient in the plants then uh we not create uh we, we don't use more water that we need okay i don't know if you understand i'm so sorry my english is not so good but i hope no i i understand. i understand your your point about increasing yeah. efficiency for water use by the plant I think yeah. that's the point you're trying to make. Oh, yes. Go ahead. Also, adding to what Tamara says, like some of the farmers, they have wells, these the ones are, that, that are very deep, um, but they don't understand like very well in how, how to water their plants. So with this uh, um, data that we will be generating, we, we can um, work you know, with them in order to... To help them um, uh, to improve their watering for their plant, I mean, some of them they just um, water them by by aspersion. If we can also help them um, move into uh, a system where the drop is just placed near near to the plant, it will also be be a benefit to to reduce water watering soon. Because yes, I say in in the in the in the beginning like. Some of them have the water. Maybe they just don't don't know how to use it in the in the most proper way. Thank you for that. Um, mm -hmm. I, just quick follow up. Mm -hmm. I would have liked to see the formula that you're going to explain to the farmers. The combination of chlorophyll data, humidity data, and then when to water and when not to water. I I think there is an equation there that you would tell farmers, and I want to make sure that you added that to your thinking that the farmers will understand that equation and then act accordingly. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you. All right, thank you to team one. I will now be moving on to team two. So team two is including Kimberly, Sajan, and Julio from UC Davis School of Med and Veterinary Medicine, and they will be presenting on Hurricane Hillary and California. Hello, uh, my fellow One Healthers. Uh, my name is Julio Silias. I'm a third year medical student at the UC Davis School of Medicine, and we're here to talk about a very important topic to all of us. But before we start, I wanted to um, have some time to introduce uh, Kimberly and Sujin so they can go over their background and then we can start on our presentation. Hello, everyone. My name is Kimberly Aguirre. I'm a second year veterinary student at the UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine. Hello, everyone. My name is Sajin Chong. I'm a fourth year PhD student in epidemiology at UC Davis. Okay, awesome. Thank you everybody for introducing themselves. So the topic of our presentation is resiliency in an uncertain world. This uh, has to do with the impact of tropical storms and hurricanes and mostly our rural communities in California and potentially some of the solutions that we want to implement to tackle these um, new onset increased storms and hurricanes in our state. Um, just a little bit of background. So as we know, California is not regularly impacted by hurricanes, and the last one was in 1858. The two most recent one, Nora and Hillary in 1997 and 2022, respectively, were actually the severe tropical storms, and they were not classified as hurricanes. So the most recent one in 2023, Hillary, actually landed in Baja California, which is part of Mexico, and then uh, migrated north and hit Southern California as a tropical storm. Um, the, that makes hurricanes extremely rare in California and makes our state very ill prepared to handle this situation, unlike other states like Louisiana or Texas or even Puerto Rico that are much more common to handle this type of uh, increase in hurricanes. So one of the main things I want to talk about here is due to global warming with this increase in severe weather and possibly a lot of more tropical storm and hurricanes are going to be coming to California. So we wanted to bring some solutions to this uh, potentially devastating issue that's going to be happening soon. 
These are some of the pictures we grabbed from um, Hillary in 2023 and some of the communities that were impacted in Southern California. So as a One Health issue, severe weather events such as Hurricane Hillary are the perfect example since it has effects on human, animal, and environmental health. In terms of human health, tropical storms and hurricanes may, can cause injuries and death for people in the area and make a secondary health impact as a result of exposure to those storms events. And also there are some potentials to spread infectious disease in emergency facilities with increased number of numbers of people. Blood can also contaminate the drinking water and cause waterborne disease outbreaks. From an animal perspective, these events may lead to direct injury and death of all animals in the area exposed to the storm event and also secondary health impacts. Same as human, there is some potential spread of infectious diseases in shelters or other closely housed areas, increased demand for housing for domestic animals after the storm event and production losses or lower performance in livestock. Last but not least, environmental health will suffer from direct destruction of the local environment and infrastructure, and there might be some losses of wildlife and flora and contamination and spilling over of natural water source resources. In order to safeguard agriculture and address other issues caused by hurricanes and tropical storms, a One Health approach is needed. A crucial component of the One Health approach is the use of interdisciplinary collaboration. Since this is a complex problem, we need to bring in professionals from a variety of fields and backgrounds to provide different perspectives and ultimately create solutions that benefit human, animals, and the local environment. Here we have non-exhaustive list of specialties that would be helpful in this situation. Our team chose to focus specifically on rural communities since this community already faces many disadvantages which further impact them during natural disaster events. These can include low socioeconomic and older demographics, a lack of medical veterinary services in the immediate area, and limited funding and resources and warning systems. Many of these communities also rely on agriculture for food and work. Since agriculture production are typically outdoors and exposed to the elements, people working in agriculture are high, highly susceptible to the effects of climate change. And this is why we decided to focus on safeguarding agriculture from the impacts of these storm events. We believe it is vital to safeguard agriculture in these communities for a variety of reasons, from protecting our food supplies, as well as animal and environmental health, to preventing foodborne pathogen spread and protecting agriculture jobs. So now I'll take a moment to talk about our proposed solutions. We wanted to approach this with a three-pronged plan involving education, preparation, and monitoring. For education, our goal is to empower the rural community, particularly farmers and agricultural workers, to utilize educational resources on disaster preparedness from organizations such as the Rural Health Information Hub and offer in-person training opportunities to promote community engagement and participation. For preparation, barns or housing areas designated for housing livestock during natural disaster events should be created to protect livestock, preserve animal production, and uh, if we can incorporate ventilation and other safety parameters, this will also help limit the spread of disease. For monitoring, treating, or uh, untreated livestock waste and wildlife waste can occasionally get washed off the land during precipitation events and can be carried to surface water bodies causing contamination and potential pathogen exposure for humans. Thus, after these disaster events, monitoring for fecal contamination and infectious status in wild animals and livestock uh, can help with early detection of contamination. We also want to identify critical areas uh, necessary for uh, locating any waterborne pathogens around the farm and fields 
because they may contaminate human drinking water bodies, and we want to install proper drainage systems prior to these events. So our solutions emphasize the importance of preparedness prior to a natural disaster in order to minimize the disaster's impact on the community and the local agriculture. This is why the general timeline for our solutions should take place as soon as possible and until an event such as a hurricane or tropical storm occurs. For education, rural communities should plan to have community meetings or town halls on a monthly or bi-monthly basis in order to get regular disaster preparedness feedback from the community and provide ongoing trainings and workshops. This is also an opportunity for local medical professionals and emergency responders to gain a better understanding of the roles they will be playing during and after a natural disaster event. For preparation, agricultural stakeholders should begin building or designating current housing areas to store livestock in during storms and hurricanes. Farmers, veterinarians, and engineers should work closely together to ensure that the housing areas will minimize disease spread and promote animal health by doing things such as having proper ventilation and spacing for animals to minimize stress. Farmers should also specifically identify workers and other personnel, such as veterinarians, who will be allowed to enter and leave these facilities during disaster events in hopes of minimizing human-animal contact in case zoonotic or foodborne pathogens are present in a herd or flock. For monitoring, local and national organizations such as the California Department of Public Health and the CDC are encouraged to send epidemiologists to help these communities set up basic epidemiological monitoring and reporting systems. Once these are set up, epidemiologists can train local community volunteers or local health workers on how to effectively use these tools and how to sample animals in the environment for pathogens in order to ultimately uh, provide early detection of pathogen presence in these areas before during and after storm events to enable the community to quickly address them either internally or by calling upon outside organizations such as the USDA and CDC. Finally, we wanted to again emphasize the importance of a One Health approach here since all aspects of our proposed solutions would not be effective without the involvement of various stakeholders and professionals. In terms of community engagement, community meetings are a great way to hear from the agricultural and local community on what their concerns would be for a natural event. This will also allow for state and county emergency preparedness and response personnel to educate the community on how to prepare for disaster events. We also want to integrate the community into the decision making process for emergency preparation so that they can have their voice heard. Community members can participate in FEMA's community emergency response team or search program in order to be better prepared to volunteer during disaster events. Finally, we believe that by prioritizing community engagement and empowering the community to actively participate in their own emergency preparedness, this will promote solution sustainability by motivating them to continue overseeing the previously described measures and maintain them over time. These are our references, and we thank you for your time and attention, and we hope you enjoyed our presentation. Thank you, Team Two, for your presentation. Uh, I wanted to open it up just for one question from the judges. Um, if Dr. Hassan or um, Dr. Ria could chime in. Hi, everyone. My apologies. My connection is not that great. Can you hear me? I was kicked out just now. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. So thank you for that presentation. Uh, I just have a very naive question. So um, have you executed your proposal or is this still in the proposal uh, space? Thank you for your question, Dr. Hassan. We have not executed it. This is more of uh, a simulated case. Um, so these are so these are solutions that we would propose for these communities to take upon themselves in order to prevent future disaster. Um, but we're currently not working to enact them ourselves. Okay. So this. Um, okay. So you haven't really gone to the field or like simulate the situation with the community to see whether it will what your solution your potential solution will work, correct? So how would you, um, when you say you're going to try to do this in a One Health manner to get all these different sectors to work together, how do you propose to do that? Is there, um, 
the mechanistic aspect of that? Do, do you have any idea on potentially how you can execute your plan? Yeah, again, another great question. I think we can all recognize how difficult it is to employ kind of the One Health approach just because a lot of people coming from you know, different fields, different sectors, they may want to approach things differently, they may have different communication styles. So overall, it can be sometimes challenging to use this approach, but ultimately, um, we all understand how effective it can be in the long term. So I think what we would hope to do, uh, since we already have kind of a connection, specifically in terms of us to be able to call upon partners from the medical health field, epidemiological field, the veterinary field, and then uh, hopefully by using connections, especially through academia, since academia is a great way to get to know uh, people in different sectors, such as people working in government, people working at the state level, federal level, uh, people in local communities, getting in touch with community leaders. I think trying to call upon already established partnerships and then wherever partnerships are not established, you know, just trying to reach out and make those connections because sometimes there may not be a partnership already established, but that may not be because no one wants to work with you. That may just be because they don't even know who you are and they don't even know that you need help. So I think trying to employ kind of that um, more positive approach and kind of saying, you know, we're going to try to reach out to people and uh, uh, utilize the network that we already have. Fantastic answer. I mean, um, um, it, it's great if there's like a real life setting already, like at least something is already established for you to just uh, nurture it and make it better um, so that it's not like starting from zero. Uh, do you know if they, uh, already there is anything going on similar to what you are proposing, maybe in a smaller scale? I think uh, specifically with like our three-pronged approach, I think there's aspects of all of them that uh, are being used, but quite separately. So I know that uh, when I was looking more into this issue, there's a lot of materials on disaster preparedness that rural communities can take advantage of. I think the issue that I came across is that sometimes people just don't have access, whether it's internet access or whether uh, they don't live in a city big enough where disaster personnel can come and actually train them in person, since that's also an effective educational tool. Um, so they're at a bit of a disadvantage that way. The resources are out there. It's just sometimes hard for these communities to access them. Um, and then similarly, I've also seen uh, uh, rural health, like disaster preparedness organizations put out guidelines for other things they could do, one of them also being to uh, make sure livestock are in uh, proper conditions uh, during and after storm events to help minimize infectious disease spread and animal morbidity and mortality. Um, but again, I think those are some things that may be difficult. The last two things may be difficult in terms of, uh, in reference to the epidemiological monitoring and the, the use of the designated barns might be some challenges in terms of cost and in terms of personnel. So when we came up with these solutions, we understood that they came with challenges, which is like, why do your solutions have challenges? But I feel like that's with anything with a One Health approach um, is that there's going to be little hiccups along the way. So we acknowledge that there's going to be uh, some cost and personnel challenges, and we're hoping for those last two um, kind of solutions that we can, uh, you know, advocate for these communities and call upon state, federal, and even international organizations to kind of lend a hand wherever possible. So one of the things I mentioned for the monitoring was, uh, you know, urging CDC or USDA epidemiologists to come and help train uh, local healthcare workers. Um, so that's, uh, Going back to your question, I haven't seen all of these things being employed in a single community. I've heard of bits and pieces of this plan separately uh, throughout different rural communities. Um, so our hope is by combining them, we can maximize uh, uh, preventiveness and minimize the impact of these disaster events. Great work. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Team three, uh, Team 2. We are now getting into Team 3. 
Uh, so team three is including Z uh, Marta, Shadira, Paula, and Enrique from UC Davis, Monterey Institute of Technology and Higher Education, and the Technical University of Madrid. And they will be presenting on drought in Panama. Take it away. Drought events exacerbated by climate change are a worldwide issue that demand a global outlook. Yet, they are also the outcome of various regional challenges that call for localized solutions. The potential impacts of drought will vary significantly across nations, depending mostly on the extent of collaboration between governments, stakeholders, and policymakers in advancing interdisciplinary strategies aimed at limiting the negative effects of these disruptions. Our focal point of exploration resides within the Isthmus of Panama, a highly biodiverse Central American nation spanning only 50 miles wide at its narrowest juncture and a vital geographical conduit that connects the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans to the Panama Canal. Ever since its conception, the Panama Canal faced critical challenges ranging between extreme environmental conditions, complex engineer planification and execution, financial difficulties, political controversies, and the implementation of sanitary programs to protect the non-immune outside labor force from malaria and yellow fever. The history, construction, management, and expansion of the Panama Canal is perhaps one of the finest representations of the importance of multidisciplinary collaboration, and as we will explore in this case study, this essential characteristic remains integral to its ongoing evolution. Now, the Panama Canal faces a new challenge. Drought events that stem from prolonged periods of reduced rainfall and the interplay between water supply and demand as it will impact not only the operations of the Panama Canal, but also more than 2 million individuals living in the basin of the Panama Canal, including indigenous communities in Vera Bounan. Drought poses significant one health challenges in the Panama Canal, affecting environment, animal and human health. Drought reduces water levels, impacting negatively to aquatic life, declining water quality, and posing a threat to the environment. Moreover, as wild animals seek water resources near human settlements, the risk of zoonotic diseases transmission grows, posing a threat to both animal and human population. This results in water shortage and poor water quality, impacting public health. Also, dry conditions and wildfires during drought can worsen inequality. This leads to health problems, especially critical for individuals with pre existing respiratory conditions. Thus, to effectively address the one health issue that we face, a multidisciplinary team should be assembled, including environmental scientists, to assess and address the impact of drought on the environment, water quality and deforestation, wildlife biologists, to study wildlife behavior changes, and zoonotic disease transmission risks, vector control specialists, to mitigate the risk of vector-borne diseases, water resource managers to develop strategies for sustainable water use and ensure access to clean water for all, public health experts to address public health issues related to water scarcity and air quality, epidemiologists to monitor and analyze disease outbreaks and patterns, agricultural experts to work with local farmers and ranchers affected by drought, ensuring food security and livestock health, economists to assess the economic impact of drought and trace disruptions, and develop strategies for economic residents, policymakers to implement policies that promote environmental sustainability, public health and economic stability, and last but not least, community engagement specific local community, drought preparedness and one health awareness. By bringing together all these disciplines, this multidisciplinary team can develop solutions from the one health perspective to address the one health challenges posed by drought in the Panama Canal region. Our One Health Integrative Solution consists of a biosecurity protocol that mitigates biodiversity loss and decreases the spread of drought-related diseases. By controlling the spread of pathogenic organisms, the risk of transmission among humans and animals is reduced, an ecological balance that sustains biodiversity is ensured, and the community benefits from gaining knowledge about the importance of biodiversity and drought-related diseases increase. We also propose enhancing the region's water supply systems to enable early leak detection in the drinking water distribution networks. Such leaks might be contributing to an unnecessary increase in water demand for human consumption in the city. 
The enhancement of water supply systems will also foster better community health and increase trust among stakeholders which can result in active involvement in water management initiatives. We also propose the development of portable sanitation and rainwater catchment systems specifically designed for residents of Embera Wonan communities nearby the Panama Canal. Recognizing the impracticality of constructing an entirely new water and wastewater system in those areas, our strategy involves strengthening partnerships with indigenous community consortia worldwide. This collaborative effort aims to provide access to proven technologies, ensuring clean water and safe waste management that aligns with the traditional and specific requirements of these communities. To evaluate the One Health Integrative Solutions impact over a time frame of five years, we propose first, enhancing Keystone species data collection to track biodiversity loss. Second, implementing low cost monitoring devices for leak detection. Third, community based biomonitoring to supplement government monitoring and enforcement efforts. And lastly, assessing active and passive surveillance systems for their effectiveness in detecting infectious diseases linked. To diminish the water quality. We interviewed different experts in the fields. We wanted to know their opinion and different solutions for this problem. Let's see what they say. Can you provide insights into the effectiveness of groundwater retention and storage during floods, along with the subsequent utilization of stored water during periods of water scarcity as an efficient strategy in this context? There's still some room, I think, for improvement in that. One of the things that I always worry about is, is it's very popular to say, well, we need to build a lot more surface water storage to capture all this flood water. And it's just not economical because you're going to have to pay for that storage every year and you might only get to use it once every 10 or 20 years. And as one of the key contributors to the transformative Calvin model, which has significantly enhanced water planning and management in California and inspired its adoption in countries like Mexico and Spain, can you shed light on the feasibility and potential benefits of introducing similar economic engineering optimization models in Panama? Oh, well, so you, you begin with a, a network model of how, how are all the interests connected mm -hmm. in, by water. I mean, all the interests in, a, in an economy are connected by water somehow. Um, and so you want to make a figure out how that connections work physically. Mm -hmm. uh, What's the availability of water, you know, floods, droughts, streams, groundwater? Uh, what's the ability to store water, groundwater, surface water, blah, blah, blah. Um, what are the uses of water? So, so environmental, urban, uh, industrial, navigation, in this case, agriculture. Um, and then you try to, for the human water uses in particular, you try to estimate Okay, how much economic benefit comes to the to the region from water that's devoted to this particular use? And, and so one of the presumptions of this approach is one of the uses of this approach is that if you know you're gonna be in a world that has less water, economically for the for the well-being of all the people in the region, uh, which sectors would you expect to uh, want to, to cut back on more. How do you envision communities collaborating with designers? And the other question is, could you offer recommendations to facilitate and strengthen these collaborative efforts? <laughs> I like to take the best of those two things and, and put them together. And I do think that we're, we're starting to see more of that kind of where there are these collaborations because especially with climate change, with drought, more and more people want to figure out how can we do things sustainably? How can we do these drought tolerant solutions? But how do we do it in a way that is still appealing? How can local communities derive benefits from incorporating drought tolerant and climate resilient garden plantings, particularly in terms of water conservation and sustainable landscaping practices? I would say the other big benefit, it's not just water conservation, but the other one is this mental health and well-being. It, once you start seeing birds coming and butterflies and, and even some of the beneficial insects, people get all excited when they see them. <laughs> Conclusion, it is imperative to recognize the interconnectedness of global challenges such as One Health, Drought and the Panama Canal. Addressing these issues collectively is vital for a sustainable and resilient future.
Thank you. Very, very neat presentation. I'll now open it to one question from Dr. Ria. Hi, uh, good morning and good evening. Yeah, uh, my, uh, maybe my internet connection is, is not good. So uh, just let me know if my uh, voice just got cut off. But um, amazing pre presentation for the uh, team three. Um, I like and I love because I'm, I'm working as a communication. So I like the way that you presented your your case. So anyway, with the um with the um questions that I would like to ask on this is about like uh, how can how can the implementation of the um low cost monitoring devices that you mentioned about the uh, community based uh bio monitoring and the keystone space um species data collection help access the impact of the one health solution over the five years time frame that you that you put and what are the potential challenges in the implementing of these measures? Hi, good morning. In in California, it's uh, 7 a.m. So good morning and, and good evening, good afternoon in every other part in the world. Thank you so much for this question. Um, and yes, we have been um, talking about how could we implement those strategies that we proposed. And in terms of leak detection, as we mentioned in the video, one of the most important aspects in Panama is that around 40% of the current water system um, access has leaks uh, that are not being detected in a prompt way. So a lot of this water demand is um, associated to a reduced in water access due to leaks. So if we, as we propose, if we try to solve this problem first, if we try to improve the current conditions of these pipes and the water system, then we can try to determine how can we um, have a better and a more adequate um, access to information on what water is going to be really needed by society and what water is was going was actually lost due to this leak detect leak that was detected. If we implement these low monitoring devices, low cost monitoring devices, we can also try to determine, okay, now that we have these uh, improved water systems and pipe management and all these uh, improvements, improvements that are needed in this community, now that we have recognized that these leaks are due to uh, si situations that were particularly intrinsic to these lower um, management in these areas, then we can say, okay, now we see that this water demand in this region was only due to this impact specifically for this population and not because they were really needing that amount of, of water. So that could provide us some ideas on this time frame of five years that people are consuming more water or if people are actually just reducing their consumption due to an improved uh, system management in those areas. Regarding the uh, biodiversity uh, keystone species, one of the most important aspects of this is that some of these keystone species are linked to the health of this tropical rainforest ecosystem. So if we can understand that this area is going to be having uh, a higher amount of um, occupied ecosystems in the region through these five years, we can say that we are not losing this keystone species and the health of our environment in this region is not declining. But on the other side, if we observe that this species extinction is lowering down and that we have a considerably high decline, we can understand that uh, this probably is also associated to declines in the environmental health of this region. So those will be the main ideas for those, the, those two strategies that we propose. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. And then the last question for this, um, I know like this is for amazing work that dedicated for the uh, proposed solution in Panama, but, but um, how about like um, this case can be adapted or scaled to uh, address similar water related challenges and drought situation in other regions globally as well? Yes, and one of the main points that we, really tried to dig into was 
if these approaches have already been implemented in the region or anything similar to those approaches that we are proposing. And yes, one of the main solutions that we have is this um, implementation of rainwater, um, rainwater catchment systems. So we already know that there have been these um, proposals of having these developments in the region, and we are trying to adapt our proposal to those current conditions. And that's why we really don't want to implement something that could not be easily implemented or could be unfeasible to adapt. And that was that is the main reason why we wanted also to focus on the indigenous communities that are living in the basin of the Canal of Panama, um, because we want to ensure that our proposed solutions are going to be adaptable and that we can also collaborate with current efforts so that will be the most important um, aspect of this proposed solution. Okay, thank you. Over thank you. to the host. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you to team three. Uh, and then finally, our last team, team four, including Zika Amokosi from Sakoin University of Agriculture in Tanzania. And they will be presenting on extreme weather events in Tanzania. So take it away. Hi, this is the team from Tanzania. Uh, we are going to report a climate change uh, related scenario uh, entitled, as reported by the media, that one dies, over 100 houses are unloofed in Bukagela, Bukoba, Tanzania. My name is Jalis Gankuba, a Master of Science student in public health and food safety, Sokweni University of Agriculture. Yes. Yes, my name is uh, Mukozi Manzarira, a student or master student at Sukhani University of Agriculture, pursuing Master of Arts in Project Management and Evaluation. Okay. So in, in, in Tanzania, we do have a Kagela region, as you can see from the map here, I highlighted or shaded dark. This is the Kagela region. It is located in the northwestern Tanzania. Yes. And, uh, <clears throat> And the way I like the way it's very unique this uh, particular region yeah. because yes. you, you we find the Bukoba municipality is yes. somehow high populated yeah. yeah yeah and there's a lot of banana yes. but we to visit it at the area yes we like to eat a lot of bananas yes banana and coffee coffee are, yes these are the most dominating uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, agricultural products so cross yes it's yeah. for commercial and stuff yes exactly. Yeah. So here in Tanzania, we do have a Tanzania Meteorological Agency, mm -hmm. the TMA. Mm -hmm. These are the ones which are dealing with the weather forecasting and the other weather related events. So the cost, they, they forecast the very recent. Mm -hmm. It was, I remember it was in August. Yes. Yeah, we, we see these not notifications yes. from the media yes. that the coastal region, this had mean the region along the Indian Oceans. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and the Lake Le 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 Johnson regions yes. will be expecting the normal and above normal uh, averages of the lake yes. the, between these two months, so yes. October and, and December. Yes. And December, yes. Yeah. And uh, it was very recently this uh, October. October, yes. Sir. Yeah, we had that scenario. Mm -hmm. It was very shocking because uh, it was uh, they reported the media the heavy rains and the strong winds yes. hitting Kagela region in the yes. municipality. Yes, exactly. Yes, so it was just a one event of rain. It was very strong. Yeah. And as you can see from the picture, yeah. a lot of houses being destroyed, distracted the buildings. Mm -hmm. Yes, plus other, other impact as we are going to talk yes. here, of course. Yes, so concerning the impacts which came after the scenario happened in Kagera, especially in Bukoba municipal, mm -hmm. there was uh, one death reported, also injuries for human <coughs> and animals, also loss of properties, high risk of infectious disease. You know, these rainfall that are coming with the yeah. uh, different uh, uh, effects like this uh, food, floods, yeah, and, floods yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. so which yeah, was so. related to foodborne diseases, infectable yeah. diseases. Yes. And the other neglected tropical diseases. Yes. yes, also there are also there are uh, environmental impacts like yes. destruction of trees, crops, soil yes. erosion. Also, the issue of food also yes. brought uh, problem to the community with this uh, scenario or yeah. this uh, uh, event happened in Bukoba. Yeah, yeah, and you know this impacts uh, in generally. Mm -hmm. We do have a lot of uh, economic. Uh, 
a crisis happened with those. It's true. You know, moving yes. people without food yes. Yes. or sure. settlements. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So the poverty is much raising, increasing yeah. to that region. Exactly. Yeah. And also mm. psychological e effects. Yes. To people are much, you know, affected, losing have, their. Yes. yes to the affected people. people. Yes. You know, yes. it's very important. Rest. Yeah. And we are going to recommend about the psychological mm. treatments. To the people okay sure it's, it's b to be engaged as part of the one health care approach eh? exactly yeah those teams Psychologists need need, to be there. yeah because we can support them with the food mm. then you leave them assessing them counseling yes. yes yeah so it's very important yes exactly yeah so the, the, the suggested solutions the one health approach mm -hmm. is the among of the basic solutions to to this climate change related scenarios like this uh, the issue of the heavy rainfall heavy rains yeah. You know, you know, the government, you know, have to come with a strategic contingency plans exactly. that will really, will have the issue of the funds. You know, mm. funds are the issue when it's come to the to, to, to the implementation of this exactly rescuing them tea. So having yeah. the funds in advance is very important. Mm -hmm. Also supporting the team technically mm -hmm. with both the skills, soft hard skill and soft skill. Soft skill yeah, sure. Yes, mm -hmm. plus also the rescuing equipment and mm -hmm. so forth, mm -hmm. which is very important. Okay. So the one health workforce team mm -hmm. well established at district level mm -hmm. yeah it is very important and engaging all of the sectors exactly human environmental and uh, agriculture sectors civil yes. engineers as we're going to to see yeah. here so uh, i think also another because what i can say yes the issue of uh, agriculture expertise yes, yes these are very important promoting agro ecological practices exactly. like the integrated farming yes. but also other practices mm -hmm. for restoring the, the landscape it yes. is very yes. important yes exactly. yeah environmental experts also we are lucky there's an involvement we, i saw different part of the teams here exactly. i happened in the one has meetings different so different participants are there so sure. this one have to be practiced even to the basic mm -hmm. levels so people to work together you know yes yes engaging in the part of the, the team Yes. yes, and also don't forget about the engineers because the engineers are the ones who are responsible for the issue of uh, infrastructure in general in the community. Exactly. So infrastructure, they need to be well maintained so that in case of any fire, yes. so it is quick and well saved the area. Yes, especially the drainage mechanism, exactly. so that no, no exactly. floods and so forth. Yeah. Okay, yeah. But other important measurements, maybe in, in shots, can yes. you describe the important measures? Yeah, uh, thank you, Zika, for that. Uh, yeah. For the issue of measurements uh, or measures to the community, mm. that uh, people must be moved from to the safe area in case of this uh, situation happen, must exactly. be moved to the safe area. Mm -hmm. Also, the issue of medical inputs should be there in the, in the place. Also, to engage the community members at the community level in the on the issue of uh, one health uh, workforce team mm -hmm. so that they can be aware okay uh, uh, anything happen yeah i yeah. agree with you this mm -hmm. was go along with all mm -hmm. other awareness to the communities and mm -hmm. best practice hygienes it yes. has been summarized there yes. so that's very important yes so okay. for the issue of policies and considerations mm -hmm. the policies are very important now yes. in tanzania exactly. we have the police which are guiding us Mm -hmm. Police's disaster management policy was updated in 2015. Yes. Yeah, it is operating there. Plus, all supportive legal frameworks. Yes. All of this addressing the importance of PPP. PPP. Uh, yes. Partnership. Public private Public. partnership. Yes, exactly. Yes. But also, the monitoring and evolution plan has mm -hmm. been very important mm -hmm. when you're doing this, especially the, the one year's initiative have to come with the uh, supporting the government kind mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. the way of monitoring and evaluation exactly. it will help with the millers for instance development of the fear of changes yes, exactly. will be reflecting because this one it really highlights key performance indicators mm -hmm. that can be generalized yes, exactly. yeah yeah Fair. but the other tools for the monitoring climate uh, evaluation you know the fgds yes focus you can group talk discussion. about that one means yes focus yes. focus group discussion also is uh, is another thing that can be more helpful on the data collection yes. uh, as a way of monitoring and evaluation. Also key informants interviews also, yes. it's important to, to collect the information on the issue of monitoring and evaluation of the situation. Oh, thank you. Very much. Yeah. Yes, sir. And the key players, we do have the disaster management and the one health section, mm -hmm. plus different one health, one health initiatives. Mm -hmm. We do have the lack on that ones. Yes. So all this can collaborate with the government yes, exactly. and also help coming more with us, you know, initiative or innovative approaches. For the one has in solving the climate related change yes. scenarios. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so thank you very much. Thank you to our final team for their presentation. 
Um, all right, now we'll ask our last judge one question. Um, Dr. Ntima, if you can chime in. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Team 4, for your presentation. I like the dialogue format of your presentation. Thank you. Um, I have uh, a few questions. The first one is uh, on your interventions, you, in, you mentioned the private sector and uh, public sector working together. And uh, I wanted to know especially how you plan to mobilize, especially the private sector to come on board. It's an area where we don't see a lot of private sector involvement. And uh, of course we know uh, for most private sector players, the, the bottom line is profit. So I would like to know your plan, uh, how you're going to convince them to be part of this kind of uh, response. And probably okay. uh, your definition of private sector in this uh, case. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, for the private sectors, private sectors, we mean even the non-government uh, partners. Uh, so in Tanzania, we do have the different uh, partners working on One Health initiatives, including some of them as a product from the universities. So they have been trained a lot uh, in the issue of the One Health and the way to engage, communicate with the communities. Uh, so we do have a lot of the youth who have even formed their, their societies, like One Health societies, but also we have the product for Afro, Afro Hoon uh, youth products. These are the genders, women and the other youth. They are just available and different. Uh, they have engaged some of them they are at the universities, but other, other, they are just working different. But uh, so for them, it is very easy because uh, there are different, this one has initiative, which are just say, focusing to some few areas. So the private sector will help uh, to scale to other areas, especially this area which has been affected or forecasted to be affected. So if they can go there and also collaborate with the government. So they have a very nice tools to communicate and also which they can even help how the community can get this message in case of the awareness and other different mechanisms for uh, assessing the situations. Uh, especially when you come to the issue of the planning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You already have specific ones that are engaged and invested in this uh, that you are use, going to use as a launching pad. Is it a completely new process that you're going to undertake? How are you planning? Yeah, we do have uh, this already. They are just in, in, in grounds. So they, they were just, you know, they, they were just limited to their specific few area, which they are just engaged yeah. like two regions. Yes. And this was just part of piloting their, their, their practice, uh, their training. So this one, if we engage them, they do have materials, they do have tools. And uh, also we connected with other, other One Health initiative uh, some of them, they're also at the university, but also working uh, in private sectors, for instance, like One Health Lessons. Yes, yes it's very famous, that one. They do have tools, different training at the communities, but also but also the, 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 the training at the schools, universities. Yeah. So yeah. that platform is, is big, but also even for us, we do have a project which called uh, the uh, Health for Animal and the Livelihood Improvement. So we we have been even for us anchored through, through that angle. We developed even material uh, for 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 instance living safely with bats in those areas which is, the, 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 there is a high risk. Uh, yes, diseases. zoonotic diseases like Kagera region. They had mabag, but it was very lucky. We we have already surveyed that area and providing to the community how to live safe with bats. But there are some earlier which there's a lot of this animal and this climate changes. We still see a lot of uh, movement, uh, different animals just coming there. I remember even in, in the last time you see, they are complaining there's a lot of bats. They needed these bats to be killed, moved. So that is, that's a big gap which is needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think 
something like community awareness for that area is very important. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the second question is what um, you've got uh, an intervention where you proposing communities to be moved to safe uh, locations or places uh, from uh, experience uh, moving communities from places where they have lived, they've grown up and lived and uh, that is where they are planning to be buried. Usually it's not a very easy uh, process. Uh, how do you, what plan do you propose, concrete actions to convince communities to leave uh, their homes and uh, any other property, livestock, including their burial grounds uh, to move to other locations? Yes, yeah, so, this one basically we we say the involvement with the key players. For instance, the disaster management team. Yes. It have the committees at a district at one level, up to the village level, and there is some one one health communities. It is not a, an immediate process. Especially, we can start with those which are focusing to those which are living on the flood plains area. Yeah, because sometimes you know it have been a tendency of forecasting. Then if the event is not happening, so you see the community now, they, they start maybe ignoring the, 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 the information because you can predict an ailing you know, this time. It, it's not a first time. Mm -hmm. Even last year, there was a prediction, but the scenario didn't happen. Now, this time, the same things, they, they, we, we have the predictions and we see now the, the, the effect is happening. Yeah. And the people, they are starting, uh, they are starting receiving the the, the the impact of this climate change. So it needed to have to work with the community. It needed a lot of awareness, uh, especially engaging them, and, yeah, so that they can be aware and educating them. Uh, so I think that that a big part. That's why we have mentioned the government. Yeah, I remember even here we the, the, we moved it. It was successful to move the people from an area which called in Longolo. This is an area where there was a lot of wildlife interaction with people, but uh, it was not easy. But uh, through education, the government has isolated it, an area, and people have moved to safe area. And this is the Maasai. It was not easy. So engagement with the government, but for us, an awareness we can help supporting the awareness, especially in terms of education. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe on your list of experts, you may want to include uh, anthropologists, uh, but thank you very much for your presentation you. and your responses to the questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank, you. Moderator. Yeah. thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for our team four. And so this is now concluding our case competition portion. Just another congratulations and thank you to our teams presenting and to our judges as well. Uh, we'll now have Dr. Zaccardi introduce our Calvin Schwabi speaker for the next portion of our symposium. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Maddie. And uh, thank you to the teams for the wonderful presentations of their talks. Uh, to keep things moving along, I'd like to introduce our Calvin Schwabi speaker. Uh, real briefly, I'm the executive director of the One Health Institute at UC Davis. Uh, the UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine uh, founded the One Health Institute in 2009 as a key component of its vision and commitment to a healthy and sustainable future. In fact, the School of Veterinary Medicine, which is one of the leading uh, veterinary schools in the world, has been preparing for this global movement for the past five decades, actually. In 1964, uh, Dr. Calvin Schwabe, epidemiologist at the School of Veterinary Medicine here at Davis, and a founding faculty member of the School of Medicine, coined the term One Medicine in his book, Veterinary Medicine and Human Health. Recognizing the close relationships between animal and human health, he pioneered the Masters of Preventive Veterinary Medicine here at the school, emphasizing the principles and strategies for disease control and prevention in animals and the importance of that uh, for human wellness. In his honor, the Calvin Schwab Lectureship commemorates his pioneering One Health work, who really did help to strengthen 
the UC Davis uh, School of Veterinary Medicine, as well as the School of Medicine's commitment to One Health by ensuring that future veterinarians integrate human, animal, and ecosystem protection into their professional work. This year, we're honored to have uh, someone who really does represent uh, this and does have a personal relationship uh, to the Schwabies as well. And that's Professor Jacob Zin Zinstag uh, joining us as the Schwabi lecturer. Professor Zinstag is a veterinarian with a PhD in tropical animal health. He spent eight years in West Africa at the International Trepano, uh, Trepano Tolerance Center in the Gambia and four years as the director of Center Suisse de Recherche Scientifique in Côte d'Ivoire. Since 1998, he heads a research group on human and animal health at the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute. Since 2011, he is the deputy head of Department of Epidemiology and Public Health at the Swiss TPH. He focuses on the control of zoonoses in developing countries and the provision of healthcare to mobile pastoralists using a One Health approach. He is past president of the International Association for Ecology and Health and a former president of the scientific board of the transdisciplinary network of the Swiss Academies. He is editor in chief of the CABI One Health Resources, and he's received a meritorious award by the World Organization of Animal Health in 2023. Um, we're very happy to have Professor Zinstag here uh, presenting his talk on One Health and Social Ecological Systems. And with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Zinstag. So thank you very much for being here. Your audio sounds a little muffled. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, maybe I, I should remove the headset. <coughs> can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. So um, I will share my slides. Yeah. Can you see my slides? Yes, we can see them. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, thank you very much, uh, Michael Sicardi, for the kind introduction. And um, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon uh, or good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, it is a great honor and privilege for me uh, to uh, talk to you today. Um, you see on this page also a web reportage, the One Health story, which is uh, made on our research group. But I'm speaking to you right now from this building in the uh, in Alschwil, in the suburb of Basel in Switzerland. So. The Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute uh, has more than 900 staff and we are working in over 130 countries in improving the health of people mainly, but also of animals uh, worldwide. So uh, I unfortunately uh, ma uh, didn't manage to meet Calvin Schwabe alive he died, uh, I think, a few months be before we came over to a sabbatical in uh, in Canada. And um, but I was uh, lucky to meet Tippi Schwabe, and you see here the wife of Calvin Schwabe, and me in Haverford in Philadelphia in the United States, and we had a very nice conversation. And uh, what I can say. Behind every strong man, there is a very strong woman. And this is Tippi Schwabe, who deeply influenced also Calvin Schwabe's work. So I will today talk to you uh, about One Health theory, about methods and examples. And I will very much look into the future of One Health, because I think we have to go beyond current uh, ways we are doing research and uh, 
we will speak about One Health in social ecological systems. This is also necessary because we need also a paradigm shift in philosophy of science if we want to tackle the huge uh, complex problems of the world. And I will finish with One Health operationalization and One Health education. All what I tell you today is also available in this book. This is the second edition of our textbook available at Kabi. And on the right side, you see the Mandarin translation, which is just about to finalize uh, together with Hainan Medical University in China. So if you don't keep any uh, memory of what I tell you today, Keep this slide in mind. This is the most important slide because it tells you what one, how we understand One Health. So One Health has necessary conditions. If you want to do One Health research, we, we must recognize the inextricable linkage of humans, animals, and their environment. But this systemic knowledge is, although necessary, is not sufficient. For us, if we want to do One Health research, we want to demonstrate an added value of health and well-being of humans and animals, or financial savings, or a better, better social resilience, or environmental sustainability achieved from a closer cooperation of human and animal health. Basically, cooperation leads to benefits. That is how we understand One Health and how we want to prove that it makes sense that doctors and veterinarians work better together. Doctors and veterinarians can each work in their corner and making animals healthy and humans healthy, but if they work together, they can make more humans and animals healthy and save money than they could ever if they didn't work together. So my first example is from Mongolia. Mongolia almost eliminated brucellosis, uh, uh, an important zoonotic disease that causes abortion in livestock and is transmissible to humans where it causes a chronic fever disease. But after the end of the socialist period, the disease flared up massively in a way that all international experts recommended World Health Organization that Mongolia should start again mass vaccinating its livestock. So this was the question. Is it profitable to mass vaccinate 25 million livestock to protect uh, human health from brucellosis? Where would you invest? Would you invest in treating all the human patients with uh, tetracycline or rifampicin, or would you invest in mass vaccination of livestock? This is a, an important question. So we addressed it by creating the first uh, animal-human brucellosis transmission model. It simulates the transmission between sheep and goat, between cattle and from small ruminants and cattle to humans. And we had 10 years data from the Ministry of Agriculture on livestock numbers and disease prevalence and from the Ministry of Health on the annually reported cases. This is also a nonlinear approach because uh, vaccine dynamic, uh, vaccination dynamics is a nonlinear process. I spare you the mathematics and we quickly jump to the economic analysis. On the left side, you see that the intervention cost of $8 million benefits only about $3 million to public health. So if you would be Minister of Public Health, you would say it is not profitable. Let us forget it. But we also interviewed human private patients about the averted private health cost and uh, the averted income loss from the mass vaccination of livestock. 
and we estimated also the incremental livestock production having less brucellosis uh, through mass vaccination in terms of meat, milk, hides, and wool. And if we summarize all the benefits, you see that is um, almost 27 million, which is three times higher than the intervention cost. So ladies and gentlemen, One Health is profitable. It makes sense to invest in One Health, but you must prove you must prove the incremental benefit. And this is why we develop One Health methods. So the second theoretical, theoretical pillar of One Health is the transdisciplinary approach. If you work between, for example, medicine and humanities as academic discipline, we call this interdisciplinarity. But if you engage a scientist between science and society, you consider at equal terms academic and non-academic knowledge in the research process, and you value contributions from all sources of understanding. And this is, by the way, an emerging career profile for you young scientists become good in one discipline, but then open up for interdisciplinary collaboration and transdisciplinary collaboration. Here uh, is an example of how we work. On the left side, this is a stakeholder meeting on echinococcosis control in Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia. On the right side, this is a stakeholder meeting 100 kilometers north of Timbuktu in Mali. But the principle is the same. We bring together decision makers, concerned populations, and scientists. And when we listen mutually to each other and we can create the atmosphere of trust, we can find ways how we can cooperate and how we can intervene in disease control in a way that is feasible for the authorities and acceptable for the communities. This is a very important pillar of One Health that we have to negotiate this cooperation that is needed between the different technical sectors, but also between academia and society. On the top of this um, panel, you see the uh, website of the transdisciplinarity um, network of the Swiss Academies of Science. This website gives you a toolbox of how to do these kind of participatory stakeholder processes. This is not trivial, and I strongly recommend you, if you want to do it, to involve anthropologists or sociologists or communication specialists. Because often this happens in multi, multiple languages, and there are power imbalances There can be pitfalls that you want to avoid in such processes. But this is clearly a, a very effective way of developing cooperation for One Health. My very first experience, and this goes now back to Calvin Schwabe, because Calvin Schwabe was also uh, deeply influenced by working with pastoralists in South Sudan, with Dinka pastoralists, and to, for me it was the same. My first One Health experience was with uh, pastoralists on the shore of Lake Chad. These people move around for hundreds of kilometers during between rainy and uh, dry season in the search for water and Uh, water and pasture, and uh, often they are devoid of health services. So how to develop health services for these people was our outgoing question. And we created, we studied in a parties, we studied in a mixed team of doctors, veterinarians, geographers, anthropologists, and microbiologists human and animals in the same time, and we found that more animals 
uh, more animals were vaccinated than children. Actually, no child had the usual uh, vaccination vaccinations of the expanded program of immunization. We then sat together in the same way as I just showed you, and we agreed to provide joint human and animal vaccination services. So when the veterinarians go out to vaccinate uh, livestock, they take along nurses who can then vaccinate children and women, provide, um, uh, provide quality drugs and do health education. And in this way, we provided health care to people who otherwise had no health care. And we saved 15% of the intervention cost by sharing the transport and the cold chain. So this is when I personally realized that one health makes a benefit. There must be an added value of working together, and we need to prove it. Another example that is more adapted to industrialized countries is integrated infrastructure. You surely know the Canadian Science Center in Winnipeg, which is one laboratory for human and animal health under one roof. And the World Bank estimates that um, the Canadian Science Center is, um, saves about 25% of its running costs because it is a joint infrastructure. Most countries in the world have separated institutions for human in contagious disease and for animal contagious disease. There are very, very few examples like Canada. But this is clearly an incremental benefit of closer cooperation at the infrastructural level. But also on the programmatic level, Canada is spearheading integrated antimicrobial resistance surveillance with the CPARS program, the Canadian Integrated Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance Program. This is one authority that looks at antimicrobial resistance in human patients, the food chain, animal production, wildlife, soil, sewage, surface waters, basically the whole ecosystem. And again, the CPARS is saving a lot of money, but also no, um, accelerates identification of sources and of spread and development of antimicrobial resistance. So these are options for uh, many countries to develop their own integrated antimicrobial resistance surveillance program. Now, already in 2012, the World Bank um, discussed issues of integrated disease surveillance and proposed this schematic in its book, People, Pathogens and Our Planet. That is 10 years old. And the schematic essentially says, if you detect an emerging pathogen in the wild, in wildlife or in the environment, the associated costs, the red line, are low. When, if you wait until the disease gets into livestock, the costs are rising. And if you wait until the disease is in humans, costs are just exploding. So this was set 10 years ago, but uh, not much happened. Uh, in surveillance systems for humans and animals are still very much separated. Moreover, what is the big risk for future pandemics is industrial high density animal production, but also inadequate biosecurity at the animal human interface. These animals here transported by a motorbike, these ducks are under a huge threat. And their probability of shedding viruses is very high. In the same way, live animal markets are not humane and should be replaced in a, by another way of trading animal, animal source food. This is the recipe for the next pandemic, what you see here, and we really must work heavily on improving the biosecurity at the animal, domestic animal and wildlife interfaces. 
So we have summarized this in that paper in Lancet in January of 23. What is the evidence for one health, of one health for global health security? And we took up the World Bank schematic. And you see the governance of the governance of surveillance response systems. On the human side, it is governed by the International Health, Health Regulation, IHR. On the veterinary side, it is veterinary diseases. And if these systems are separated, they don't communicate and we risk future pandemics. So the vision is a One Health governance that would bring together in, um, animal and human surveillance in a way that we can implement a true One Health governance that can probably not avoid the emergence of new um, uh, diseases with pandemic potential, but at, re uh, at least reduce massively the risk of it. These kind of systems exist already. In Northern Italy, we have the West Nile virus surveillance response systems that is completely integrated. It looks at mosquitoes, wild birds, horses, and humans in the same time. And it saves already money because uh, contaminated blood conserves uh, are not given to patients. So, because the veterinary and the public health surveillance systems communicate together, they can save money and reduce the time to detection of new outbreaks. We are doing the same in the Somali region of Ethiopia, actually in the Adadle Boreda and Shinile Boreda, in the Chichiga University One Health Initiative, which is funded by the Swiss Agency for the Development and Cooperation. And in this little office, we have a veterinary officer and a public health officer, and they receive the calls from the villages on new outbreaks, and they can quickly discuss together if they have to take measures to prevent, for example, uh, people from being infected with Rift Valley fever. In the same time, we um, discuss with communities who organize themselves in micro insurance schemes and also accelerate the communication from the villages to the surveillance response system. This surveillance response system is integrated in the public health bureau of the Somali regional state and reports to the um, disease surveillance, the health information system of the federal Ethiopian uh, government. So the system is completely integrated in the existing public health and animal health structures of Ethiopia. Let us now look into the future. You are all aware of the complex social ecological crisis of wars, of loss of biodiversity, of uh, ecosystem destruction. I don't have to read this all to you. You know it and you see it every day on the television. These are the future challenges and we ask ourselves, how can we address them? The second most important risk is actually the fragmentation of science. Science progresses continuously and becomes more and more specialized we all become specialists of very, very narrow topics. That drives the progress. But in the same time, we become specialists that are no longer able to solve compl complicated problems. If science is only valued by impact factor and number of publications, this is a perversion and leads to predatory journals that attract publications just for publication fees and not for the scientific content. So we have a moral and technical crisis in science, a cognitive and a moral crisis in science. But there are young philosophers 
who call for a new enlightenment. We have to fight fake news. Fake news are fake. And we need to stay to the truth. We need to enlighten the people with the truth. And we have to create a new enlightenment that brings together matter and spirit. This is a disastrous uh, separation in current science. So one of these philosophers is Corinne Peluchon from France. And I'm sure her book will soon be available also in English, if it is not already. The other philosopher uh, is uh, Marcus Gabriel, who claims also that we should um, not only believe in a one-sided faith in science, that we should include all knowledge, that we should truly become transdisciplinary and transsectoral, that we must interconnect humanities and social sciences, that we must cooperate between natural science and social sciences and involve politics, business and civil society in the way we work as scientists. So we claim that One Health is an example of such a new enlightenment approach because our perspective moves away purely from human anthropocentrism to a multi-species ontology. We no longer speak only about humans, we speak about humans in their environment and together with their animals. This is also driven by so-called multi-species anthropology. We move away from positivism that accepts only material evidence to multiple realities. If you work with traditional indigenous people and communities, you must respect their own epistemic perspective. So we must become uh, must take a multi-epistemic perspective. Marcus Gabriel called that, calls it uh, uh, epistemic modesty. We must, must be more modest in what we consider as uh, our own knowledge. And we move away from Cartesian determinism to process philosophy similar to what has been promoted by Alfred North Whitehead. And in this way, we are armed to tackle modern complex problem solving. And here comes now really the new stream where we interconnect natural resource management and, and health. So here I present you the American economist. This was the first woman who got the Nobel Prize in economics, Eleanor Ostrom who worked at Indiana University. And her award-winning book was called Governing the Commons. In that book, she criticizes the so-called tragedy of the commons. The tragedy of the commons by Hardin in the 1960s means that if we have common pool resources, they are invariably overused and destroyed. So if you have a fish pond, everybody goes and fishes as much as he can, and then there is no fish in the pond anymore. Or if you have a meadow, everybody puts as many sheep on the meadow until the meadow is destroyed. That is the tragedy of the commons. And ladies and gentlemen, we are currently living a tragedy of the commons with the raising problem of antimicrobial resistance but also with climate change, with global pollution, with ecosystem destruction, we are really living that tragedy of the commons. So what is the way out? So Elinor Ostrom says, this is right in principle, but there are many communities in the world who manage their um, natural resources in a sustainable way for hundreds of centuries. And the principle, you see it here on the right side, these communities commit to collaboration, they co-define the dilemma, they co-design the use of the natural resources, 
and the interventions they want to create solutions. So common coal resources are rivalrous. There is not enough for everybody or just everybody should use just a little bit. And we cannot exclude people easily. And interestingly, the first example in Elinor Ostrom's book is the mountain village of Turbel in Switzerland. And um, this little village manages his forests and pasture um, and water in since 700 years in a sustainable way at the cost of stabilizing the population. And uh, it happens to be that I was born down here in that village uh, close to Turbel in Fisk, and my father had a house in Turbel. So I'm personally tied to that common pool resource management example. But what has that to do with health? You can compare the commonality of Ostrom's social ecological systems approach and one health. First of all, by sustainable management of natural resources and incremental benefit of a closer cooperation between human and animal health and collaborative governance and the transdisciplinary participatory process. If we combine that, we can, um, we can assess sustainable natural resource use and health in the same time. And we can look at good health while preserving the environment, while becoming carbon neutral and while sustaining the ecosystem services like um, animal products or clean air or clean water. And we need the participatory process and co cooperation at multiple scales in the household, in the communities, at national level and at international level. This is the only uh, personal uh, direct record I have of interaction with Calvin Schwabe. Calvin Schwabe, before he died, he sent me this book, Science, Spirit and Wholeness, a Quaker Scientist Sense of God. And he uh, made a personal dedication uh, to me. If you have read that book, you will see that Calvin Schwabe proposes a further force in nature. He calls this the attractor bonder postulate. And he claims that besides the strong um, nuclear force and the electromagnetic force, there is a social attractor bonding force between humans. I live since 40 years with my wife, so we have a 40 year at uh, bonding uh, in, in marriage. And also Charles Darwin said in his uh, um, book on evolution, he says a tribe that aids each and another has surely a selective advantage. So cooperation is not only at the level of men and wife or a couple of any sex, it is also at the level of community. And I interpret that social force of cooperation of Calvin Schwabe is essential for actually the necessary cooperation for sustainable natural resource management. So what did we do now with this concept? We declare health as a common good or as a public good. So health and human resources become part of the social ecological system of Elinor Ostrom's concept. This is the framework of the social ecological concept of Elinor Ostrom and Marginis. You have the resource systems, forest, pasture, water, and so on. You have the resource units, fish, wood, uh, animal source food, plant source food, and you have the actors. 
you and me, communities, governments, these are all the actors that have negotiated the use of the resource system. This is all governed by governance systems. And we enlarge this concept by including human resources and human resource units. If you lead a healthy life, you will contribute about 40 productive years to the gross domestic product of your nation. Or inversely, if a boy or a girl that die at 10 years from rabies because they are bitten by a rabies dog, 40 years of productive life are lost to the nation. So if we include humans, and of course also animals, in the social ecological uh, system of Elinor Ostrom, we can include natural resource management and health in a strategy analysis that is here in the center to find solutions that improve health while maintaining natural resource systems. So this is what is new. This is the future of One Health. This is the cutting edge of One Health. And we have produced already the first case study. And we did it at the example of rabies. Rabies in Africa is mostly transmitted by dogs. Now you can save the life of a human that is bitten by a rabies dogs by apply, applying post-exposure prophylaxis. But this will never interrupt transmission. And you have every year to continue that because rabies is endemic in general. But you can also intervene in the in the source. If you mass vaccinate livestock, uh, if you mass vaccinate dogs, you can interrupt transmission. So we did this in a case study in Chad, the capital in Jamena, the capital city of Chad. We mass vaccinated two times 20,000 dogs. And here you see the two gray bars are the mass vaccinations. And you see that the number of rabid dogs collapsed within two months. And we had eliminated rabies for more than two years. After the disease came back from the outside, because rabies is a transboundary animal disease. It crosses countries. If we do the economics of that and compare human post-exposure vaccination, we have ever accumulating cost. If you mass vaccinate dogs, you have higher cost at the beginning, but because you interrupt transmission, the slope of the curve is less steep and you come to the point of break even after which dog mass vaccination is cheaper than human in the intervention in humans. I'm sorry, <laughs> this slide is in German, but I explain it to you. And this is now what is completely new. Here, for the first time, we have applied uh, transmission dynamics of rabies be between dogs and humans at the African scale. And we can demonstrate that <clears throat> compared to post-exposure prophylaxis, coordinated mass vaccination of dogs between countries leads to elimination of the disease and achieves cumulative savings of $10 billion in 30 years. What does this mean? If you start mass vaccinating in South Africa, you coordinate with Namibia, Botswana, Zimbabwe, and Mozambique. And they vaccinate in the same time. And then the disease will not come back to South Africa. <laughs> or if you start in Mauritania, you coordinate with Mali, Senegal, and the Gambia. And the disease will not come back to Mauritania because in the west you have the uh, Atlantic Ocean, in the north you have the Sahara, and rabies will not come back from, from these places. So this is the first social ecological analysis of a One Health intervention. Here you see the intervention cost. 
For example, this country, Cameroon, after seven years, dog mass vaccination becomes more profitable, more, less costly than the intervention in post-exposure prophylaxis. But some countries don't reach that break-even point because post-exposure prophylaxis of humans is always the best choice because the vaccine is always available. But if we include the human capital benefits, mass vaccination of dogs becomes the best option for all countries. We have reached a Nash equilibrium. So we can, in this example, show that by including human resources in a social ecological model, we can demonstrate that interventions in animals are the best solution for eliminating diseases that can otherwise not be eliminated. This is the cutting edge of One Health research. Here is the conceptualization of the social ecological system. We have dogs as a resource, humans as a resource system. Dogs are a very important resource systems for herding as watchdogs and even as food. So we save the dogs, we save about 700,000 dogs if we mass vaccinate them instead of letting them have um, rabies. Here are all the actors involved and the governance systems. And this is the intervention either in humans or in animals. So this is the uh, conceptual chart um, of Elinor Ostrom's social ecological system adapted to rabies elimination in Africa. We can say today that One Health is the best operationalized uh, integrated health concept. The group of the seven biggest economies in the world advocate One Health in their Carbis Bay Declaration. So how can we operational, operationalize One Health? One Health lead, needs strong leadership because there is huge power differentials in between the different sectors. The public health sector has about 30 times more power than the animal health sector. This is a reality. Therefore, it is in the best case, it's the president or the prime minister of a country that should bring together all the involved ministries of health, livestock, agriculture, and environment. That should take place not only at the government level, but also at the provincial level. Furthermore, all the um, laboratories should also, always, also be in, uh, included, possibly joint laboratories, the private industry, the non-government organizations, the citizens, the indigenous communities, and the municipalities. And this is the recipe for making One Health to work. If somebody can lead consensus processes of cooperation between ministries, between provincial governments, and in communities, One Health is socially layered. In conclusion, One Health should generate benefit from closer cooperation between human and animal health, health and other sectors. One Health problem solving requires a participatory transdisciplinary approach. It should lead to a change of mindset from ministerial silos to close intersectoral cooperation. One Health governance must clarify institutions. Who should participate? What are their roles and responsibilities? What is the chain of command? How do we communicate? What are the standard operating procedures? We have to identify the most important priorities and start working on one or two key topics. The lowest hanging fruits are integrated surveillance response systems like I showed you in Ethiopia and in Italy, or integrated antimicrobial resistance surveillance and joint infrastructure, as I showed you at the examples of Canada. But there are many more, in particular antimicrobial resistance surveillance. We have an online course which is currently running on the uh, 
future learning platform, but also on the platform of the University of Basel, Tales. Uh, you find it quickly and it is also tutored. And as I as it was told, I'm the editor of the KV One Health platform that brings together human health, plant health, environmental health, and animal health combined with a case study database and a knowledge data bank. Again, I would like to thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak uh, about the One Health at the Calvin Schwabe Lectureship. I think I brought you the, to the edge of, of One Health research, and I look forward to the young generation, to all of you, to go way beyond. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Professor, for the uh, wonderful presentation. Um, we do have a couple of questions that came through in the chat, and I believe Michaela is going to ask them. Hello, everybody. Thank you again, Dr. Zinstag, for your amazing presentation. Um, we did have a couple questions come through in the chat. Although we don't have time for all of them, there were a couple that I did want to address. Um, the first of which um, pertained to your slide regarding vaccination for brucellosis, I believe. And they just wanted to clarify a point um, regarding vaccination of only females and um, young adults or children and why you think that is so important. Well, um, nomadic pastoralists in, in, in Chad, they have basically no health service. So providing preventive vaccination for children and women is a preventive service that spares them from many illnesses. Of course, we should provide even better health services. But what we have seen is that just sending around cars with medical teams doesn't solve the problem. We need, we need different solutions. But combining combining human and animal vaccinations saves already resources and makes it cheaper. But of course, we should provide more than just a preventive vaccination services. That is clear. Yeah. Great. That makes sense. Um, thanks for clarifying that point. Um, I also wanted to just kind of bring up one other point that you had made about the segregation of human health and animal health and how important it is to kind of um, create a cross bridge between the two disciplines. Um, and I guess that's going to be our future generation's problem to kind of solve. Um, so just uh, moving along with that, uh, you've obviously had a very successful and impactful career in the um, field of One Health. And so for students that may be interested in pursuing a career somewhat like yours, um, do you have any advice or um, uh, kind of cornerstone pieces that you'd like to touch on and how students can get involved in order to um, take part in One Health as a whole? Yes. Look, we have to live with the realities of the modern academic um, uh, life. And it is still so that I'm against uh, just a general One Health education. I still recommend you, either you become a veterinarian or you become a medical doctor or you become an anthropologist or a sociologist and you become recognized in as a disciplinary scientist and once you have you have you are recognized as a disciplinary scientist then open up then you can start working with other academic disciplines or with or with uh, communities so at the, I, I showed that emerging career profile. You can then open to work with, as a veterinarian, I work with mathematicians, molecular biologists, sociologists, anthropologists, linguists. I work with all these disciplines and we respect each other. So all the mathematical modeling I presented you has been done by mathematicians. One Health makes no concession on disciplinary excellence. Whatever we do is cutting edge science. That's why you must yourself be a specialist. 
But more than a specialist, you must be open for inter and transdisciplinary collaboration. That's my recommendation to you. Got it. Yeah, I think you bring up a great point in saying that as scientists um, in the community, we all kind of have to lean on each other to um, make changes and um, progress uh, in science as a whole. Um, thank you so much for your time again. Unfortunately, we don't have any more time for questions, um, but we do appreciate you being here. And so we'll go ahead and move um, the presentation on to Dr. Jenny Lane, and she's going to give us some information about some programs we have here at UC Davis. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Dr. Zinstag, thank you so much. It's such an honor to have you join our symposium today. And I loved how you were able to mix philosophy with the, with science and I think educate all of us a little bit on some topics that are not as familiar to, to some of the scientists in the room. So thank you so much. Um, as we segue and move to the panel discussion, we're going to um, we're going to skip the break so we can stay on time, but as we move to the panel, um, I just want to quickly put a little advertisement in for a field institute that we run called the RX One Health Field Institute. It's organized through UC Davis, and next summer we're going to be offering it in at the end of June for a two-week course in, in California. So I encourage you to, to go to our website, uh, learn more about the course, and... Um, we will. Um, we'd love to see applications from from graduate students and earlier early career professionals from all disciplines from all over the world um, are invited to to apply. So, um, let's move to the panel. Um, yep. And Dr. Smith is just reminding us that if you have more follow up questions, you can put them in the chat. And to address. Um, we will have a recording for the slides um, for the entire presentation will be shared after the event. Over to you, Raleigh. Hello everyone and uh, welcome to our panel on wildfires. Today we'll be hearing from some of our fantastic, uh, fantastic world professionals on world on wildfires in different areas. Um, specifically, we have today with us Dr. Ruth Dominic Hardy. Um, she is coming to join us today from UC Davis as a recent um, addition to our, our UC Davis faculty, um, as well as Dr. Brianna Hamoto, who is uh, part of our, she's one of the veterinarians and part of the CVET. Um, one of our emergency responses from here in UC Davis as well. And then Dr. Federico Castillo, who is coming in from UC Berkeley, um, who is part of the economics department and working specifically with the Latinx population um, and the effect of uh, wildfires and other global disasters and the, how they disproportionately affect populations. So Doctors uh, Dominic Hardy, Dr. Hamoto, and Dr. Castillo, if you could please, um, I'm going to see if you could please show your camera, and then I'm going to pin you. All right. Well, thank you again for coming. Um, and just to give everybody a little a little insight into what we'll be doing today, we're gonna to be having this panel. It's going to last for a total of 45 minutes. Um, to begin with, I'm gonna be giving a brief overview of, of wildfires and why this is an important topic. Um, then we'll have each one of our panelists come in and provide a brief introduction. While I'm giving the introduction on wildfires, if you have any questions that come to mind on things that you would like to ask our current panelists, um, they'll be answering questions and kind of synthesizing information after they do their, their introductions. You could please put them in the chat. And um, with that, we'll get started. So a little background on wildfires. They're becoming a general part of our everyday life, um, unfortunately. I'm from Southern Oregon, and this has been um, 
a reality for me. My whole family works in the area of of wildfire uh, prevention and response, um, specifically with de delivering waters to wildfires. I've lost, unfortunately, some, some close personal friends due to fighting wildfires, as well as had some very um, close calls with some family members and some and, and, and accidents. This is becoming a quite a normal everyday um, life for us. And the, the, the truth of the matter is that this is not just specifically here to the United States. This is a global issue. Um, we have here currently um, some pictures of, you know, you can see from, for example, Canada from earlier this year, Spain last year, uh, Turkey and Greece. This is something that we're all having to deal with and it's just getting worse. And it's expected to continue to get worse by increasing by at least, they said around 14% uh, with by 2030. So this is something that we need to address from multiple angles. Uh, there's issues that we need to be addressing from how this impacts human health, how this impacts health on animals, and also what we can do in terms of addressing this from politics, policy, how we're addressing emergency. So again, just to show just a kind of a larger global issue, this is a this is a picture from um, the Chilean fire fire in 2017. And the smoke and the general outcome from this fire alone could be viewed from space. This is something that impacts our entire population. This also this impacts our currently how global warming is infected. It releases a lot of carbon dioxide into our into our atmosphere and has general implications for overall our entire health of the of the of the planet. So with that, we will move forward. And Dr. Castillo, please, if you would let us know a little bit about yourself and how things and uh, your current projects of interest. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, uh, Rollins and Jenny and Watrina and the rest of these, those attending this, uh, this session. I very much appreciate your time uh, and I hope everybody's doing well. My name is Federico Castillo and I am uh, actually, I'm not with the economics department at Berkeley. I just want to clarify, I'm with the environmental sciences department uh, in a very specific way. No worries with the Berkeley Institute now. So uh, I am an environmental economist. I'm a trained economist. <laughs> uh, I have been doing research on uh, climate change related extreme events uh, for the last quite a few years now, the last 10 or so, more probably more years particularly as it relates to uh, farm workers and the impact of climate change on farm workers. So uh, uh, I've been working with the planetary health centers, uh, with the planetary center of planetary health, part of the University of California Global Health Institute on these topics as well. And uh, I've been concentrating on two, many, on two main types of extreme events, which is heat and strong wildfire work that we have been doing. Why? because uh, my, my research centers on farm workers precisely. And farm workers work outdoors and heat and wildfire impacts are very important for their well-being. We already know that farm workers are uh, a population, a segment of the population at a huge disadvantage in terms of working conditions, housing conditions, uh, pay rates and so on and so forth. So when you have a wildfire, what you have here is uh, uh, an, an event that impacts their health in terms of uh, uh, their ability to perform their work. Farm workers are already being paid. Not some of them don't even earn the uh, uh, minimum uh, poverty level rate wages. So when you have a wildfire and the wildfire disrupts their work, either because they cannot work outdoors or because it impacts their ability to perform properly their job that they're being asked to do, which is a strenuous or a physically strenuous, then you have a socioeconomic impact here. So farm worker loses um, uh, by being exposed to these density concentrated smoke plumes that are the result of wildfires. Farm workers are now uh, not only uh, uh, impacted uh, 
from a wage earning capacity also, but also in terms of migration, some of them are being forced to move to work to other areas that they were not supposed to work. And of course, it impacts their ability to um, uh, to bring uh, to bring uh, food to the table, which is ironic. It really is ironic uh, because uh, farm workers are already suffering. And uh, research shows that they and my recent research shows uh, the one that we just finished in the Central Valley over the last month. Our preliminary data shows that at least fifty percent of farm workers are already suffering from food insecurity. When you have a wildfire that reduces earnings and wages and reduces the hours work, that means that this food insecurity is likely to be uh, more uh, acute than otherwise it would be. Uh, we have a regulatory issue as well with wildfires, which is uh, research has shown that farm sites are monitored less frequently than other areas impacted by wildfires. And so we don't know really by being uh, less monitored, we don't know how prepared, how well prepared are our, our farm workers. For example, uh, we don't know the equipment that they are available to them. Uh, we don't know, for example, very much about their ability to cope. Even if they were to have the equipment, is this equipment uh, appropriate, culturally appropriate even, right? So early warning systems, provision of equipment that allows them to mitigate the impact of wildfires and so on and so forth, is something that we definitely need to work extraneously in order to, uh, to to work very hard in order to make sure the farm workers or those working outdoors, construction workers as well, or construction workers in highways and so on and so forth are impacted the least. So uh, also, I just want to point out that wildfires uh, pose a problem. And in the sense, if you look at the picture to the right, uh, you see farm workers working while there is a lot of smoke and plumes of smoke out there. And we have a tendency to believe that the smoke is not here, is is there, out there somewhere. And sometimes farmers ask farm workers to stick around, to work a little bit longer, because the thing is not here, so to speak. And we know that not to be the case. So there is a whole host of cultural, socioeconomic issues related to wildfires that impact farm workers that make it a very difficult task to complete. Uh, uh, to, to complete in terms of mitigating, minimizing the impact of these farm workers or these wildfires on farm workers. I would like to move to the next, if I may, slide. I also want to point out that wildfires, while wildfires pose a very, very uh, specific threat to farm workers' health, their ability to earn a living, their ability to uh, provide food for their families, uh, and to that they impact their, their housing conditions even. Uh, I also want to point out that farm workers are uh, exposed to a series of environmental threats that compound the impact of wildfires when they occur. So you look at the two maps on the right, on the left here in this slide, what you see is pesticide use uh, for a couple uh, years, 1991 and 2017. Pesticide use per unit of land in California. And if you look at uh, if you look at the map on the right, the one that shows the average summer uh, maximum maximum air temperature, and this was I should have added here. This was for 2020. Uh, sorry, 2019. Uh, this was for a paper that we published uh, in 20 in 2020, but the map was elaborated in 20, 2019. It shows that heat occurs. Really, almost to the to 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 to, uh, to with an almost exactitude where pesticide where heavy pesticide occurs. So farm workers are exposed to heavy pesticide use. They are exposed in the same locations and almost at the same time to um, to uh, heat waves. And then you add wildfires as yet another layer of environmental threat to farm workers. But again, let me emphasize this is also for other types of workers, outdoor workers. Uh, and so there you have it. Uh, you have a multiple threat uh, that farm workers are exposed to uh, and that we need to somehow, this is a wicked problem. This is the wicked problem that we all have seen in class and our faculty members explain to us, uh, but it is a wicked problem that we need to somehow do better at, at tackling and minimizing the impact.
So thank you very much. And I will pass the torch to, uh, to I think, a professor. Who, who is next? I'm, um, thank you. Yeah. Hey. To Professor Hamamoto. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Castillo. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. It's really an honor to be here. Um, I recently joined the California Veterinary Emergency Team here in the One Health Institute, but a little bit about my background. Um, I actually got started in wildfire response as a student. So I was part of the student veterinary emergency team. And my first fire was actually the campfire. So a lot of my experience has been kind of boots on the ground um, as a response as a veterinary student, and then later in my career as a veterinarian. So over the last five years or so, I think I've counted that I've responded to about seven wildfires in a veterinary capacity. Um, so really, a lot of experience and a lot of different um, scenarios that you kind of see in these um, these wildfire responses, especially in the animal shelters. I've been um, on search and rescue teams, so I've actually been out in the field kind of in the devastation, and I've also worked a lot in the different shelters. So I think it's really interesting to kind of put my experience into a One Health approach. It's been a really fun way to think in the last couple of days as I've been preparing for this panel. Um, so thank you again for having me. I hope I can provide some insight on some of these things. Um, Raleigh, do you want to go ahead and thank you? Um, so just a little bit of a background kind of on the the way that I'm going to come at the, the questions on this panel. Um, thinking about animals and disaster, right? It's It's a relatively, I won't say new field, but it's a rapidly evolving field. Um, so really, it kind of has started in this companion animal scene. So the California Veterinary Emergency Team really focuses kind of on domestic and companion animals and livestock, um, really with that idea of the human-animal bond kind of at the central focus of our team. Our mission even states that we're out to help animals and their families that are affected by these devastating wildfires. Um, really, it's becoming an increasing public health concern, as you'll see in my next slide and what I'll start talking about later, but just kind of think keeping that in the back of your mind. Um, I apologize. <laughs> my dogs are chiming in on this. I'm sorry. Um, but really, some of the interesting research that's been coming out um, across the literature is that really kind of putting companion animals at the forefront of our preparedness efforts may help in influencing um, people and motivating their preparedness. So kind of using these ideas of, are you prepared to get your animal evacuated might actually lead to some of these communities thinking about it in a different way and actually motivating them to take the steps to prepare for these disasters. Um, so kind of changing focus a little bit onto the food animals. We do a lot of livestock. I'm an equine veterinarian by training. So this is my heart and soul and is with the food animals and the livestock. Um, so really, again, you, you get into that human animal bond idea, right? And I think it's really interesting when I was thinking about kind of Dr. Castillo and the work that he does with the farm workers and especially the ranch workers, a lot of them are very bonded to these animals as well. So kind of taking the psychological part into consideration there are critical economic implications um, and food and nutritional security as well that come along with these animals that are impacted by disaster. So really the central themes moving forward that we're going to kind of focus on are the com companion animals as a risk factor for humans, which I think is kind of a, like I said, a rapidly evolving area that we're all starting to really think about and do some research on. Um, and then companion animals as a risk themselves. So them being at risk of the devastating effects of these wildfires. Okay, really. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so like I said, I was going to touch on this a little bit, and this is a very brief overview. So please, if you're interested in this, do some more research. There's some really fascinating literature out there. Um, but really, animals in response kind of came to a forefront in Hurricane Katrina. Um, there was a lot of reports that people weren't evacuating because they didn't want to leave their pets behind. And this um, really led to a big compliance issue with these evacuations. So it kind of showed officials that, hey, we have to really be putting animals in the forefront of these evacuations or else we're going to have some public health implications as well. Um, this led to the Pets Act, which is actually helping to put this at the forefront of emergency management. 
So from there, it's been this really rapid evolution. There's community animal response teams that will go out and help with evacuations, with sheltering. Um, it's just kind of the, the structure that I talk about is more the structure in California, but it really kind of starts at a local level and goes up to a state level and then a federal level from there. There's state animal response teams. Um, California Veterinary Emergency Team is a state veterinary emergency response team. There's other states that have similar structures as well. Um, and then there are the veterinary response teams. So ones that kind of come to the forefront that you might've seen in the news would be Texas. They have a really strong team as well. Um, and then of course, California. Um, so some ongoing challenges. I kind of sat down with my team yesterday and kind of thought about some of the ongoing challenges moving forward um, with animals in response that we would like to bring to this panel. And that really comes with integration, um, standardization, training, and funding of some of these programs. So those are kind of my idea is moving into this panel. Thank you. Hi, can you listen to me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I am going to follow. Uh, thank you uh, for uh, inviting me to this uh, panel, and I had the opportunity to follow a bit the, the, symp the symposium. And I think it's uh, amazing how you, you approach that in One Health. And I, I, am, I come from Spain. I was born in an area that uh, had very dramatic fires. So I started uh, thinking that fire were very uh, dramatic, very bad. But then uh, I ended up studying them more in deep and, and I could see the good part of fire, the good part of, uh, of, of uh, fire as an ecological process. So I've been doing research in fire behavior and fuel treatments effectiveness over my career. And now I am based here in UC Davis, but most of my experience, of course, is in the Mediterranean basin. And here you have, uh, I will start with a couple of, of examples of, of uh, um, how uh, it, the problem of wildfires goes above the, the climate change. And here you have an example of uh, my area. This is Catalonia. This is the statistics. It uh, um, reflects a trend in the time series towards the decrease of surface area affected. So you see in the last... Uh, 40 years, how um, it looks like firefighters are better. We have less um, um, surface affected by wildfires, but we have events in some years that are very, very catastrophic. So that it doesn't mean in this graph that we um, will we are um, decreasing the area. We are just waiting for a big year now. So that is what we call fire paradox. The more effective extinguishing services become by extinguishing small fires year after year, more and more fuel is uh, continuing to accumulate in the forest, so the disaster will become uh, um, bigger. So um, that's not a problem of climate change. Uh, like sometimes, usually we we say we blame climate change, but uh, we build this problem up. And um, how we have arrived here, in this case, there was a, a land abandonment, lots of years of abandoned land. Can you can you change the, the photo, please? Yes. And another one? No, well, uh, in this photo, there was a, there is a piece lost um, that showed how it was in the 50s, this area, but no, never mind. I wanted to show you that in in 100 years the change of of the landscape has been dramatic, and we could see that, but we didn't realize. And uh, as the professor Sinstak was was telling us, this is a socio ecological process. What happened here? That after here in this area in Catalonia after the civil war, uh, the the land was so used, and and there was no maybe a four percent of forest in these areas. And after that, people start to emigrate to the city. There was this rural exodus and land abandonment. And so forests start to grow. And, and we forgot all the landscape. And then we started to 
um, focus on it again when wildfires, big wildfires uh, appeared. But then uh, we start to build also in these areas. So there was not just a problem of wildfire, the, the, that was also a, pro a problem of uh, civil protection. When there is a fire and when there are houses, animals and people, and you cannot defend a forest, you defend yourself from forest. So we, we start defending forest and we ended up defending ourselves against the forest. And so how we can address this? Um, First of all, I think it's very important that we understand forest and disturbances. Fire is one of more disturbances of, of the of the fo of the forest. So we have to uh, know how to read it. Um, is not uh, landscape is not something static. It's something that is moving and it has processes. I always like to see that forest is not composed by species by animals. It's composed also by processes. If we take out the processes, this ecosystem is not viable anymore. So um, we need not to take a single photo, but to look into the into the into the processes. And I've I, I've been working also in 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 fuel treatments because it's one way of uh, addressing this problem. Um, um, introducing again some tools that we. Um, we were fear of fire, but we can address the, the problem with low intensity fires and also providing people with the tools to again uh, work in the land and not just uh, a picture. We, we don't have to take just a picture, but also uh, to to work in the land and to take care of it. Thank you. So uh, we do have a question for Dr. Castillo. Uh, um, what measures do you think could be taken to protect vulnerable populations such as like farm workers and, and animal during wildfires and while also minimizing environmental degradations and also ensuring economic sustainability? Um, thank you, that's a, that's a big question here. Uh, I, I would say this: uh, uh, we need to create uh, we need to create systems. By systems, I mean generate information and actual uh, actual items that vulnerable populations can uh, actually do, as opposed to generating something in paper that it might look good, but that does not necessarily lead to actionable items on the part of the vulnerable population. And what I mean by that is this, let us suppose that we create a very good early warning system in terms of wildfires, and we warn the population effectively to take care of their animals. And I, I will let the, uh, you know, Dr. Hamamoto probably speak better to this than I can, but in terms of, and, and Dr. Dominic, but in terms of you know, what a human being can do in regards to the assets they own and how they can either move away or take measures to stay in place and not be impacted greatly. But these measures need to be need to be culturally appropriate. And by that, I mean, not necessarily bilingual. So we don't need to warn our farm workers in Spanish, just that, you know, there is an event coming up that tomorrow is likely to be a bad hair day and so a air day and so on and so forth. What we need to do is that these folks, once they are warned, they are able to do something about this. And farm workers are not able, even if they're warned about an event like a wildfire, they're not just able to say, I'm not showing up to work tomorrow, right? Uh, there is a whole social component, a layer of power that the farm worker is exposed to. And the same thing goes for mental health, by the way, which I think Dr. Hamoto has more to say about this than I can, uh, because uh, this impacts mental health, not just wages and earnings, as as I uh, I did I forgot to mention that as well. So again, cultural culturally appropriate systems that allow the individual to take care of himself or him, him or herself, their family and their assets, animals, um, livestock, or any other action that is possible to minimize the impact. I would say is important. Uh, the other thing is, 
we are working on a, just to provide an example, uh, to close this answer here from my perspective, we are working on a project where we are trying to come up with a system, even an app, that farm workers can use that inform them, inform them about heat occurrence on the areas that they're working on. But again, how much does an app or how can an app help when the farm worker is informed that tomorrow or today, you better don't show up because it's gonna be 106, but the person cannot just not show up. So you need to have this actionable, viable, culturally appropriate, legally, legally viable, et cetera, uh, systems that minimize the impact for farm workers. And uh, I would say the creation of a fund, for example, when workers cannot work, when we buy our food, uh, we could very well, if we were asked, many people will say yes to, hey, let's add three cents to the price of a lettuce. Three cents. And between all the lettuce that you purchase in this in the state of California, I can assure you there will be a ton of money available for farm workers uh, to compensate them for the days that cannot work. But you know, uh, there is the politics and the sausage making or policy making that goes, that gets ugly sometimes. But I think oh, there are, you know, creating funds that assist farm workers is one way, but creating by cultural, culturally appropriate systems to cope with mental health issues, livestock, pets, and their other assets, the farm workers, or the, the people who work outdoor space. So I will stop there. I hope I I, I know it was a it was a it was a very complex question, but I hope it helps. Mm -hmm. No, I think we all appreciate that answer, Dr. Castillo. In in the in the very middle little time that we do have left, um, do do any of other panelists have anything that they want to add? I think that's a very big question that's very hard to answer in thirty seconds from my yeah. perspective. So I um I think that really. The thing that we as CVET are starting to see too is just um, getting some of this information to the populations that are more affected and more vulnerable as well. Um, there is a program that California has called LISTOS. I don't know if anybody is aware of that, that I became aware of not too long ago. That's, it stands for READY. Um, and they kind of more, they apply disaster preparedness to human populations based on their cultural needs, um, which I think is really fascinating. So I was actually on their website yesterday, just kind of looking, they have all these different resources. They have stuff for kids. They have like coloring books and things like that. It's really fascinating. So I think if we kind of take an approach more like that from the animal side too, I think this is an area that all of us can improve on. And I think an area that CVET would love to start to um, explore more of how can we get some of this preparedness, um, you know, conversation happening that's more of a one health approach I guess is what I'm trying to say <laughs> again hard to answer in 30 seconds <laughs> exactly no I and I really do appreciate like you're moving forward with it um in terms of that I think this could bring us to our next question that I that I that I, that I received um which is how then can um we approach wildfires and wildfire preparedness from a One Health perspective, knowing that, for example, there are some components like that Dr. Dominic was talking about that, you know, we do need wildfires and they can, they can be helpful. But that being said, in an appropriate setting and under an appropriate um, condition, how can we merge these ideas um, to not only be able to pr provide preparedness, but also to be able to allow appropriate methods um, for like, for example, burns and for when, you know, just in case things do get out of control, for example, how do we like strike this balance between using fires and preparing for the worst? Can I go? Yeah. Um, I think that the one health um, approach is very good because you cannot not approach that in one single way. It's very complex. There are lots of uh, disciplinarities uh, playing a role and we have to look into all of them. And what I um, learned with all of my experiences is that you have to look what in the landscape has been done. This is the, the, the thing that was working before we came with all of our ideas and say no more fire. 
so that the landscape was working, those communities were doing great there. So we should start listening to the communities to stop or, or to prevent it. And I have a, a great example in, in also in, in my area. And there were there was a big fire, and it, that fire uh, was in a, an area that was abandoned, and then industrialization came. So it was one of the first areas abandoned abandoned in, in the region. And then it was close to a winery area. Uh, they sell the wine very, very, very expensive. So the fire stopped when the vineyards started. So these people that was working there stopped the fire. And so why don't we um, help uh, farmers to stay in the land? Because then we will have to pay uh, with government uh, in money to treat these areas to stop the fire. So we will have to use public um, incomes. Um, so that's my 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 point. We should always do the 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 um, the laws and all the uh, things looking into the place and the people. Thank you so much for that. Um, in terms of how I see, there's another there's another question, and we're, we're running out of time. I wish we, I know that this this could have this could have lasted all day long in itself. Um, but there is a question I do want to address, which is how can students actively be a part of this? You know, how can it? You know, we have many students around the world who and other people who are who could get involved. How can they get involved at their own personal levels? Again, huge question, but. <laughs> I mean, I can speak from my perspective because I was a student, right? Like I started all of this as a student and I'd say just get involved. I, I see Dr. Castillo is talking about community-based organizations as well. From an animal perspective and from an emergency response perspective, there are a lot of community-based organizations. Um, CERTs, as you saw, the California emergency response teams do humans as well as their California animal response teams as well. So find your local resources, sit down with them, talk with them. Do they have an animal emergency response plan? What is their, you know, plan for other areas that you're interested in. Um, really, I think the big thing that comes down if you're taking it from a One Health approach is to just start the communication. You as a student have that power. You have the knowledge. You are probably want to be the, one of the smarter ones in the room just because you're actively getting all of that knowledge like infiltrated in you right now. Um, so go talk to people. Go let them know what your passions are. Let them know your excitement. Um, and I think that's really where you can start, start those conversations. If you have, um, the ability to talk with emergency management officials in your, or in your local jurisdiction, I think that's an amazing place to start. Cause really you're going to have people from public health there. You're going to have people from hopefully an animal representative there. Not always, unfortunately, that's one of the challenges we're coming up against, <laughs> but, um, I think that that would be my advice for students. And if animals are what you're interested in, please reach out to us at CVET. All of us are so passionate about this and we're happy to mentor anybody that wants to talk more about it. Um, and really the One Health Institute is an amazing place to start as well. There's so many resources there. So find your resources, start those, those conversations would be my advice. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just want to add one little sentence here, Perfect. if I could. Absolutely. Uh, when, when, when we say community-based organizations, uh, I, I'm a big fan, if you will, of community-based organizations. They know their communities well. They know who can assist uh, research researchers and research institutions on the field. They know actually what are the questions that you need to ask. Sometimes we say, well, we need to look at this research question. It turns out to be the math question might not be socially relevant in the communities that we care about. But the most important thing that I want to emphasize is that we need to engage with them as an equal partners, not just as a structures of information. Uh, and I want to, you know, as include them in, in those budgets as much as we can possibly do as researchers and as students who go to the community to uh, to engage them. So I just want to make sure that we engage community-based organizations from a, an equal equal partners with different objectives. You know, we are academicians, so, you know, that's what it is. But they 
they deserve as much budget as, as we can possibly provide them and as much technical knowledge as we can possibly share with them. Yeah, just stay in it. Stay in the yeah. obvious, I think. Yeah. Thank you. No, but I, I can't tell you how much we appreciate all of you being here and, and being willing to talk about this and also offering your, you know, your expertise as somebody that any of these individuals can reach out to if they're interested to. It's it really does mean a lot for us as students um, to have people who come in as as mentors within areas that are in such needs, such as this one. Um, so I really, really I want to give a huge thank you to you all from uh, the One Health Institute for being here today. Thank you very much. And I think there was a really, there was a great question that was off, offered uh, by Kimberly in the chat, if one of you would like to respond to that in the chat. Um, at this time, though, we do need to continue and move forward. And I'll be turning the time over to Amalia um, for the rest of our uh, rest of our, our meeting. But thank you again so much for everything. Thank you for having us. We really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. Yes, thanks. All right. Thank you to our panelists. That was fabulous. Agreed. I think we could spend many more hours talking about that. Okay, we're in the final stretch, the last few minutes of this symposium, and um, many everybody who stuck out stuck it out the whole time. We are now at the time for our award ceremony, which I think everybody has just been in their seats for. Um, and we actually have two awards to announce, so two different competitions. We had the Global One Health Case Competition, which has been um, our judges were busy judging um, after the first hour, um, so we're going to announce that. And then we also have the awards for our inaugural multimedia contest. Um, Dean Stetter is going to announce the case competition. Dean Stetter, are you are you there in the universe? Yes, I am here in the universe, and thank you. Um, so. First of all, uh, congrats to all the students and teams, some phenomenal presentations and and really, really enjoyed that. And also thanks to the judges. Um, we know it takes a lot of time to, to review these and it's, it's challenging with so many great ones. So without further ado, envelope, please. Here it comes. Here we go. Drum roll across the world. Literally, our first place is Team Panama. Congratulations. That's phenomenal. Great job with that presentation and your research and your work there. Runner up is Team Hurricane Hillary. And um, thanks again to everybody. And I'll turn it back to you. Thank you very much for helping announce that and for being part of the festivities. Um, our winning team, um, we will... Um, let's, sorry, I just got distracted by an announcement on Zoom I've never Ever seen before. Um, we will be reaching out to you around um, follow up and we'll be posting all of the team videos on our One Health Symposium website. Please. So thank you for your efforts there. Okay, and moving on to our multimedia contest. So um, as I mentioned, we had an inaugural multimedia contest. This was open to students across um, University of California well as Afrahoon and Siahoon networks, so the African One Health University Network and the Siahoon, uh, Southeast Asia One Health University. And we received almost 40 submissions from the Afrahoon and Siahoon networks, which was fabulous. Um, and I'd like to share. Um, so we have some honorable mentions, one each from Siahoon and Afrahoon. So um, Narikarn and... Um, Pia Pat from um, Thailand um, submitted an, an infographic carousel, which is an on-trend social media type of um, multimedia that we are going to be able to feature. And then also Jan and Rain from Cote d'Ivoire submitted a very charismatic video. So thank you to you for your entries and drum roll for the winners. Um, we are very happy to announce that um, Denise and Sylvie from Rwanda submitted a video that um, really focused that focused on zoonotic disease in the community control in the community and really looked um, at the diversity elements of that, which was fabulous. And then Nora and Nadira presented an, um, a video 
that was from, from Indonesia, from their Sohik experience. So thank you so much for your entries. And we'll also be reaching out to you around prizes. So um, that, that's it for our winners. So thank you very much for everybody for competing in the contests. I do want to take a moment and just acknowledge our friend, Matt, and who we lost earlier this year, Matt Blake. He was, this is the first symposium we've run without him. And um, he was dearly missed. His absence was felt throughout this planning process. Um, we channeled you. Um, thank you, Matt, for everything you'd shared with us in the past years. And... Um, we're going to wrap up. Here's another pitch for Rx1 Health. I'm going to pass it over to Smith if she has any last words. Thanks, Dr. Lane. Yep, I think Matt would have been very happy with the way things turned out and having 20 plus countries, I think, represented in our participants during this symposium today. So thank you. And I hope this is just the beginning. I hope that we can find ways to keep in touch, to keep engaging around these important issues. And if there is anything that we can do to help, please don't hesitate to reach out. We are certainly happy to make e-introductions or continue these conversations with any of you um, who are with us today or have ideas on how we could keep furthering these um, important ideas and, and One Health approaches in action. So we will go ahead and close the One Health Symposium that is part of the Consortium of Universities for Global Health virtual week. Um, there are other sessions planned during the week. So if there are, are other topics that you might be interested, certainly feel free to browse that on the CUGH website. All of them are free and open to anyone around the world. And there will be an in-person CUGH conference in Los Angeles in the spring. Um, and so that is a, a separate but linked event. Um, but I am really happy that we were able to do all of these online sessions in a way that we could have it be very participatory and, um, and welcome friends from around the world who might not always be able to travel in person. So thank you so much. And we will look forward to talking to you soon. Um, if there are other things, we'll stay on for a few more minutes, um, but we're going to go ahead and close the official symposium now. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day.